So first paper is by Idri. Uh, uh, it was written by, by, by four researchers. We have Maria Alejandra Ariano, we have uh, Jihan Boutaibi, uh, Damien Barchich, and Sebastian Treyer. And I think, Sebastian, that you are introducing the matter. So uh, it's my pleasure to give you the floor. Thank you very much, Regis, and thank you very much for the organization of this very interesting research program and all the academic days that we are going to, to live through. Um, my colleague Maria Alejandra is going to uh, uh, project the, uh, the PowerPoint, but in, in, in the meantime, I'm going to uh, introduce the paper. As you see, our focus was on, on uh, scaling, scaling up uh, how PDBs can uh, uh, really manage a transformative alignment with Agenda 2030. And I think it's worth mentioning that uh, uh, the heart of what we are discussing is this issue of uh, transformative alignment to, to, to try and assess to what extent public development banks are currently aligned with Agenda 2030 or not, and what are the conditions for them to scale up that capacity to align. Um, and I think it's worth mentioning also that, uh, of course, this uh, paper rests on two basic assumptions. The first, I think we all share, but it's worth mentioning it. Uh, it is that Agenda 2030, uh, as an integral transformation program uh, is the compass for reconstruction uh, in trying to exit the, 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 the current crisis. Um, that means, uh, when I mean integral transformative program, that means that it's of course important to align reconstruction with climate objectives, with reduction of inequalities, but with all objectives at the same time. And, and that's about a realignment that is necessary. Um, and, and a transformation that is going to be specific to each territory, to each country, but even within the country, to each uh, regions within the, within the countries. Um, the second assumption is that uh, public development banks can and will play a vital role uh, in times of crisis, in particular because they have uh, uh, the capacity to, to play a counter-cyclical role, but also uh, given what I've said in my first assumption, uh, they are, are very relevant because they can address and understand the specific needs of territories and countries when they when this territory needs to realign its reconstruction path to be to be aligned with the, the transformative nature of Agenda 2030. Um, to do so, uh, so so if you agree with those two assumptions, um, that means that PDBs need to change and be able to implement that. Um, and, and that means that uh, what, what, is at, what is at stake in this, um, in this, uh, in this paper is that, that, that this is, even if uh, PDBs and public development banks have a big potential, this change is actually a revolution in terms of their institution and the way they relate to their ecosystem. Uh, and so we are trying to assess uh, where they stand in regard to that type of transformation of their own, of their, of their own institution. Um, and to what extent uh, the, 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 we could help uh, understand what are the, the conditions and the levers for that transition to happen. Um, so, so basically, the, the, if, if I want to state the basic objective, the research uh, that Maria Alejandra and the colleagues have, uh, have uh, done is to assess if and how these public development banks are embracing the 2030 agenda as a driver for transformation of the economy. And uh, as a consequence, uh, are they embracing the 2030 agenda as a driver for their own transformation? Uh, and that uh, has been done through two types of, uh, of analysis. The first type is a quantitative review of their financial indicators to try and assess uh, their capacity to take uh, more risk in order to, uh, to support the necessary transformation to agenda 2030. That has been on a sample of uh, public development banks uh, chosen to, because they were contrasting in their size, so, so diversity of public development banks without being really able to have a, a representative sample, but at least the representativeness goes to the diversity of banks that have been uh, analyzed at key four moments in the last 10 years. The second type of analysis is more qualitative, uh, and it's about their practices and processes, how public development banks, uh, are they, how are they aligning at different levels, the strategic level, uh, the operational level, and also in their external engagement uh, um, with the other stakeholders and clients in, the, in their ecosystem. Uh, so what we end up with is, is assessing that there are, uh, I'm, I'm already spoiling the conclusion, but I think it's important to have where, uh, an understanding of where we are heading to. There are a lot of innovative practices, uh, a kind of a, the, the revolution that I was talking about is emerging, but it's for the moment only emerging. 
Um, and this is why we discuss in the end the conditions to scale this up um, and increase the capacity to impact on both reconstruction and transformation. Madame Alexandra, the floor is yours now to uh, get into the details of our results. Thank you, Sebastian. So uh, moving on uh, with uh, with the presentation. Uh, wait, is it is not moving right? Okay. Uh, here in uh, in uh, this slide, you will find uh, two figures that uh, help us summarize briefly our assessment on lending. Uh, as Sebastian mentioned before, in this first part of the presentation, we focused on assessing the granted loans in respect to the shareholders' equity of the sample of development banks, which is called their, their gearing ratio. And um, it's important to state that although we are aware that public development banks have at their disposal other financial instruments like guarantees, for example, loans are still the main instrument used by these banks and it is also their main asset. In our sample, loans represent the 69% of their total assets. On this first part, we can highlight two important results. First, we see that there is a large heterogeneity between national development banks, some of them with loans to equity ratio close to two, which means that for every dollar in equity, the bank has lended two dollars. But there are also other banks with gearing ratio close to six and eight, like for example, Pinagro, as you see uh, in the graph. And this means that these banks are being more ambitious and are extending loans six or even eight times more than their own equity. Um, in average, we see that national development banks are being less conservative than multilateral development banks. And our second uh, main result of this first part is that for us it's quite clear that, uh, as you see in the second figure, this indicator has not really improved substantially during the last decade. Uh, once the values registered in 2009 and 2019 are compared, just some banks have really improved their loans dispersed in relation to their shareholders' capital. A remarkable percentage of them have reduced or kept unchanged this ratio and still remain at uh, very conservative levels. As a uh, main takeaway of this first part, uh, we see that in order to achieve a greater impact, it is important for these banks to expand their lending capacities, uh, particularly uh, by, by being less conservative with their lending practices, by making use of other financial instruments at their disposal, like guarantees, like co-financing that we know that is becoming even uh, more important uh, as they pass. And uh, for those banks that are betting on being more ambitious, uh, shareholders should think about uh, capital injections for them to really be able to scale up their efforts and have a greater impact on the territories in which they operate. Um, but also this has to come hand in hand with a real transformation in behaviors and investment practices. And now uh, we move on to the core of our study, which is based on very interesting discussions that uh, we had the opportunity to have with uh, several uh, development banks, uh, officials that we interviewed and uh, the revision of reports from uh, these uh, banks with uh, of different geographies, of different sizes and of uh, different business models. Here we identified innovative practices that they uh, are uh, implementing and that we think that are a very good basis to generate uh, fruitful discussions among uh, public development banks. As examples, we have, for instance, uh, FMO in the Netherlands that has defined an SDG cross-cutting, um, uh, has defined different SDG cross-cutting themes that drive both their strategies and operations 
and we see that this is allowing them to generate a greater impact with their entire portfolio while investing in underserved markets and uh, fragile states. Their approach also includes a strong focus on following up their clients' progress on meeting their environmental and social standards, and uh, they also support them in building a more sustainable business in the long run. So in a way, this covers both a strategic and operational levels, and it's a sign of a bank that is trying to have a more comprehensive approach towards aligning with sustainable development. Another interesting example that we can highlight in this part is uh, uh, DBSA in South Africa that uh, while trying to structure their SDG pipeline has created a project preparation fund that helps them conduct pre-feasibility and bankability studies and thus uh, provide a strong support at early stages of project preparation process. We see that in this way, they ensure that their clients can not only optimize their projects to minimize negative impacts, but really design the project in line with the SDGs from the very beginning. Um, nonetheless, we think that uh, most reviewed banks are in what we could call an initial phase of alignment where for example, they have taken the decision to modify their strategies and link them with certain SDGs or uh, use social and environmental safeguards as preconditions to approve credit loans. But these approaches, uh, we think, still reinforce decision making in thematic silos. We also see that, uh, as Sebastian mentioned at the beginning, actions are still scattered and are not really systematized at the portfolio level as a whole and therefore they may lose forcefulness and visibility of its possible impact. The 2030 agenda is much more than a long wish list and uh, the public development banks should be able to place a stronger focus on understanding the interlinkages between the goals and the targets and really take advantage of the synergies among them. As recommendations of uh, this first part, um, we think that strategies should lead to a complete comprehensive and systemic integration of the SDGs. And uh, this approach should be anchored at the heart of decision making and really permeate all processes of public development banks. Banks need to widen their scope of analysis to the portfolio scale. Uh, one of the key challenges is not just to develop a, pile, a pipeline of uh, good individual projects, but to try to develop a comprehensive portfolio. Also, um, in terms of mainstreaming SDG considerations within the whole investment and project cycle, we think that uh, public development banks should have in place, for example, a comprehensive exclusion list that bans sectors with negative sustainable development impacts and help them avoid investment that, for example, indirectly drive deforestation or accentuate the lock-in in carbon int intensive technologies or have ex post evaluation mechanisms that include quality performance indicators um, or segmentation of end beneficiaries and which are uh, able to measure how much the different flows actually contribute to sustainable development. And Maria, uh, Maria if I may, uh, yes. you have three minutes to uh, okay. go to your conclusion. Thank you. Okay, it's, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah? <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, and uh, finally, on the external engagement side, we also see that there are efforts that are permeating and defining how banks relate and engage with their beneficiaries and other stakeholders. Um, we have different examples that you are going to be able to see in the study, but COPIDE in Peru and Banco Nacion in Argentina are some of them that are working really hard to have a more permanent dialogue with their clients and beneficiaries before and during the lifetime of uh, their investments to really understand the sustainability challenges on the ground. And um, thus, uh, as recommendations to move forward 
on this part, we see that public development banks need to embrace and take real ownership on their roles as enablers and catalyzers of sustainable finance. We see that there is a huge window of opportunity to have uh, an impact not only through their financing, but only but also through their non-financial services. There's a lot still to, to learn. Uh, there are uh, concepts that need to be harmonized and methodologies that need to be harmonized, but also uh, examples from the private sector should be taken into account. And uh, as uh, conditions for success, and this would be my two last uh, remarks, Regis, it's important to, to be aware that uh, public development banks need to count with the support of other actors to be able to really have uh, an impact and become agents of change in their territories. Governments should uh, seek to have a strong policy frameworks and uh, tailor-made regulations for them to, to develop the transformations that we need. And lastly, credit rating agencies should also think in mechanisms uh, to have uh, uh, to support a more ambitious uh, investment. And we could even think of having an SDG credit score that in a certain way incentivizes public development banks to be more ambitious and less adverse um, to risk uh, in, in their investments. Thank you. Well, it thank was you very, very much. short, but I, <laughs> yeah, I tried to do it's, my best. It, it's short, but your paper is there uh, and can be uh, can be seen by everybody. I mean, these are really very interesting recommendations, I think, uh, and and it's short also because we want to uh, keep some time for questions. So uh, uh, this is also for all participants. Uh, I mean, keep your questions for when we finish the session. We will have a thirty minutes uh, left to. Uh, uh, ask to the panelists, you know, some precisions or some uh, additions to what they have uh, presented. We can now switch to uh, the second paper that uh, we want to be uh, to see to be seen presented today. I mean, this one was produced by by Samantha um, Atridge of of ODI by Jajun Su of the Institute of New Structural Economics uh, in Beijing, and by Kevin Gallagher uh, from Boston University. Uh, the question here is, is to go into a more specifically, uh, more focused uh, SDG, which is energy and more specifically renewable energy, and to question the role of DFIs in piloting and scaling up the clean transition uh, energy. Uh, also um, quite a very important subject. I think, Jajun, you are starting the presentation, so the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Chair, for the kind introduction. So the motivation behind our research is the recognition that clean energy transformation is of paramount importance in achieving the Paris Agreement on climate change. So by clean energy transformation, we mean that the accelerated deployment of renewable energy within a relatively short period of time. And analytically, we believe that DFIs German finance institutions are well positioned to take up the task for the following reasons. They are created by the government with official mission to provide long-term and high-risk capital to achieve their objectives. But little has been done trying to study uh, uh, the role of DFIs in accelerating clean energy transformation and our paper aims to fill this gap. So our presentation today will start with the three research questions that we want to delve deeper into, and then we will share with you what are the comparative advantage of DFIs in piloting and scaling up clean energies. And then we we'll dive deeper into the sector specific risks. And, and, and then we will introduce you the specific financing approaches and instruments deployed by DFIs in, in, in uh, piloting uh, clean energies. And finally, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, end up with the key recommendations. Well, the central research questions that our paper try to tackle are as follows. First, what comparative advantage do DFI have in achieving clean energy transformation? And secondly, what are the key barriers and risks to financing renewable energies? 
And finally, what financing models have DFI deployed to pilot and scale up clean energy transitions? Let me start with the first one, comparative advantage of DFIs. Based on our in-depth uh, interviews with practitioners from uh, five MDBs and, and uh, four MDBs and five NDBs, we realized that there are five key common advantage of DFIs in taking up these tasks. The first one is that DFI is well positioned to provide patient capital at affordable price. The reason is that DFIs often do not take out a deposit. Instead, they rely on the sovereign credit worthiness to issue bond on the capital market at a relatively low price. This enables them to better tackle the risks of maturity mismatch and to provide patient capital that is much needed, especially for renewable energies that take, take time to get incubated. And secondly, DFI have uh, in-house technical expertise. For example, when I did an interview with CDB, China Living Bank, they argued that expert, the energy expert at CDB, they try to focus on the system level different outcomes, and therefore they take a whole supply chain approach to invest in both upstream and downstream and in order to incubate the market. And thirdly, DFIs, they are often you know, claim themselves as honest brokers because they can actually uh, collaborate with the government and to coordinate the policy and even shape the policy. And this is very important because we realize that the policy uncertainties is one of the key barriers for countries to scale up the renewable energies. So DFI can help to mitigate these kind of policy risks. And fourthly, DFI, they are very uh, uh, well positioned to, to become the, a pilot to make the demonstration, to achieve the demonstration effect in order to overcome the first mover challenge. This is very important because often at the early stage of uh, the development of renewable energies, they are faced with huge uncertainties and they need to demonstrate the viability of the project and to incubate the market for private capital to follow suit at the late, later stage. And finally, it's very important that DFI, they try to go beyond the project level and try to make investment in the very complementary infrastructure, such as transmission and transmission line of uh, the renewable energies. And by doing so, they can you know, help to scale up the renewable energy investment in a concerted manner. So these are the five competitive advantage. And now I'll hand over to my colleague, Sam, to introduce you the sector-specific risks and the financing models by DFIs. Sam, hand over to you. Oh, thank, thank you, Jai Jun. Um, uh, I think I put up the wrong slide. So in the interest of time, so essentially what we found was we found um, four key risks uh, which DFIs faced in scaling up their uh, investment in renewable energy, but also in piloting uh, new technology and the development of new technology. And these four risks concerned a technological risk, political policy and regulatory risk, macroeconomic risk, and a bankability risk. Um, and we found that the key technological risk was the top risk, which hinders the development of new technology whereas the political policy and regulatory risks are the core risks to actually scaling DFI investment in renewable energy. We found that all, all these risks recur, occur regardless of the level of development, except for the foreign exchange risk, which was especially problematic for national development finance institutions. So I'm now just going to um, talk about the financial approaches and instruments, the key observations that we found. There's quite a lot here, so I'm going to kind of do a, a whistle tops tour. So please uh, forgive me that I may not cover everything on the slides. As we just said, the papers are available online. So we were interested in kind of how to establish what the comparative advantages are and the risks. What are the approaches and instruments that these DFIs use? Um, and at the outset, I think it's important just to state um, that really the, the kind of the bread and butter of DFI 
business basically is, is senior direct lending and co-investing uh, with a view often to mobilize you know, private investment in renewable energy. And this dominates the DFI approach. But given the challenge of the climate emergency and this urgent need to transition to a low carbon climate resilient economy, we focused on this issue about you know, scaling renewable energy. We, we need to scale rapidly. Uh, so we're interested in instruments which scale, uh, but also you know, we're interested in instruments and approaches which also pilot and develop new technologies. Um, so we're not really looking at kind of the, the direct you know, uh, vanilla lending. Um, and as you can see from this table, we see a, quite a diverse risk uh, range of instruments and approaches uh, which DFIs use. So quite a diverse toolkit. But as you can be see, seen from all the DFIs that we looked at, few, perhaps apart from the IFC and the Development Bank of Japan, have what we could call a, a comprehensive toolkit across the range of instruments and approaches. And I should also say at the outset that the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank is kind of like a new kid on the block. And so it's very much in its early days and developing its approaches. So it has a fairly vanilla approach to, to, to investment at this juncture. Um, and as you can see from the table in the paper, what we do is we group instruments and approaches into four broad categories. Those which seek to scale investment, which include loan syndication, pooled investment vehicles, green bonds, and also uh, looking at the standardization of, of DFI products. Those which aim to provide risk capital across the different um, layers of the capital stack. So at the very bottom of the capital stack in an investment, you would have an equity position, which carries the most risk because the return to the DFI is the most variable, dependent on the profitability and return of the investment itself. Through, if you like, as you move up the capital stack to instruments which we would classify as, as kind of mezzanine finance, uh, which could include instruments like preferred equity, uh, convertible grants and loans and subordinated debt, right through up to the top of the capital stack where you would have senior debt, which carries the least risk. Um, we then have a third category, which looks at providing access to finance, especially for SMEs and households who undertake smaller uh, renewable energy investment. And then finally, uh, this important issue around project development, uh, which was highlighted in the previous presentation. So I'm going to whip you through some key findings we found at the instrument level, and then I'm going to uh, finish by kind of making some overall observations on what that means for policy. So in terms of scaling, and there's a lot you know, in the paper, um, so I'm not going to go into all the detail of all the specific examples. I'm trying to reflect on kind of observations by groups of DFIs. So we find um, basically that loan syndication is, is used obviously for large infrastructure investment. And the majority of this is in the form of what we call A and B loan structures, uh, where the DFI provides the senior loan, retains a portion of that for its own account and sells that on to the private investor. And that's very much at specific project level. And there are a number of advantages of why DFIs uh, use this approach. And it's a common tool basically used by all the DFIs that we interviewed, except for the EIB and the AIB, for the Asian Investment Infrastructure Bank, it was because it's fairly new. And for the EIB, it's because 90% of its operations are in Europe, where the markets, the renewable energy markets and capital markets are fairly uh, well developed and there isn't the need for their intervention in that way, uh, there's, there's the risk of crowding out. So essentially, this is a very attractive tool for DFIs to, to really scale investment in renewable energy, in established renewable energy in particular, such as solar, onshore wind and hydro investment. Um, it enables the DFIs to diversify their risk on their balance sheet, which is very important, especially as many of them issue on the capital markets, and it allows them to manage their risk exposure. But importantly, it also leverages a very important comparative advantage, and that is uh, the, the soft enhancement that the role of a DFI participating in a loan um, syndication can offer. Um, so, for example, CAF gave us the issue, you know, most, well, their investment is in Latin America, um, uh, a region, you know, known for a lot of macroeconomic uh, volatility. 
And by having CAF in the loan syndication and its preferred creditor straight status, in the event of a foreign exchange crisis, uh, investors will be able to get hold of their money in foreign currency. But it also leverages their origination capacity. So many DFIs, and we'll see this later on, kind of you know, develop pipelines. So they're able to leverage that origination side of their business and crowd in larger uh, financing packages for renewable energy. And this actually was also very important for small NDBs, say, for example, the Development Bank of Rwanda, whose operations, if you like, its operations, that leverage, which was spoken about in the previous presentation, uh, is, is constrained because of the small balance sheet size. So loan syndication is very important. And a final observation that we observed was basically the kind of the, the use of this, this approach very much dependent, uh, depended on the state of the development of renewable energy markets in the countries that these DFIs were looking to invest in and capital markets. I've already mentioned EIB not participating in loan syndication in Europe, uh, for example, but also in the Development Bank in Japan doesn't participate in loan syndication on established tech uh, renewable energy markets. This is very much in stark contrast to other DFIs, if you like, who work in developing countries where these markets are not so well developed. Um, so moving on, another instrument, this was extremely common. Basically, all DFIs that we looked at who issued on the capital markets have issued green bonds, the exception being the Development Bank of Rwanda, but this is because they don't issue um, bonds on the capital markets. Um, and the, what I'd like to highlight here is, you know, we observed a really clear role that these banks played in developing um, the green bond markets in these countries. Um, in fact, for all national development banks, uh, they were the kind of like the pioneer issuers, if you like. Um, but there have been a number of challenges at the country level, including um, kind of underdeveloped capital markets, lack of bankable projects and currency mismatch. Another important approach which DFIs can take um, to scale investment is the use of pooled investment vehicles. Again, this is a really important um, uh, uh, approach which DFIs can use because it enables them to attract institutional investment at scale. These institutional investors you know, look at large ticket size investment and are attracted to the, the diversification of a pooled invest, investment vehicle. Um, and again, it kind of, as I mentioned before, it leverages this issue around kind of the soft uh, enhancement that a DFI can uh, provide. It's kind of like a seal of approval. Importantly, though, what I wanted to say here is, apart from the IFC's asset management company, all the DFIs interviewed say that they are not in managers of third party capital, but they do invest in third party managed funds and often providing the seed funding for these funds. Although we did know to trend that most developing country uh, development finance institutions did not invest in these pooled investment vehicles. Um, and briefly, product stand standardization is, is fairly straightforward. Essentially, the idea of this is, is for, it's basically for these banks uh, to standardize their investment products, um, which can reduce transaction costs, especially for small scale uh, renewable energy. And we came across some good examples of China Development Bank and the IFC using that approach. Um, just quickly, I think I'm, I'm just gonna highlight just a couple of observations here. I think, as I've mentioned, the majority of the kind of instruments used is a senior debt. Samantha, just sorry to interrupt, but if I may, you are already at your 15 minutes. Okay. So uh, you will have to reach conclusion rapidly now. Sorry for that. Okay, sure. So um, I think I'll make four observations on the, on the risk capital, as I say, the details in the paper. One is basically that the majority of DFI investors, as I said, is senior debt, although most do provide, if you like, higher risk capital. But for many national finance institutions, this was often financed by external concessional resource, which is really important. And only a few DFIs, if you like, provide that kind of equity and mezzanine finance, which is funded by their own balance sheet. Again, often it's uh, funded by external um, resource. We also see very limited use of, of guarantees at the national level. This is often because of a lack of track record, so it constrains the ability to price and understand risk, but also policy um, uncertainty. And we came across some interesting convertible financing approaches, especially in geothermal development, 
uh, but again, reliant on external concessional resource and the risk is not carried on the balance sheet. Foreign exchange risk was a major issue for all development banks, uh, but especially for, if you like, the nationally based development banks. Um, and it proved you know, problematic in terms of their ability. Hedging, as we know, is expensive. It can be for some exotic currencies between five to 10% of project cost. Um, so it's affected the ability, uh, sometimes as a deal breaker um, in some instances. And uh, the final observation here is that all, all development banks, regardless of whether they're multinational, uh, multilateral, regional or national, really highlighted the importance of using external concessional resource to blend with their own account for various reasons detailed in the paper. Uh, the access to capital very quickly um, essentially is used by M uh, the multilaterals to overcome this ticket size issue and that locally finance based institutions are better placed to finance risk. And this all DFIs had project development facilities. Um, again, the point to observe here is most of them are funded externally. So very quickly, just on the insights and policy recommendations, the this is the last slide, the majority of DFI investment in renewable energy is focused on scaling existing kind of technology. It's not in the piloting and development of new technology. And so we think that basically we make a recommendation that especially for multilateral development banks who have access to external capital and cheaper capital, they should step up their uh, efforts in this area. As I said, um, the approach is dominated by senior debt. We need more innovative kind of instruments um, and it reinforces this importance of concessional finance and climate, um, if you like, climate funds um, and this very important role in project development. But what we find and what, I, what we recommend then is given those two observations, MDFIs should really step up their engagement and channel more resource through these <coughs> and we should be looking at how these institutions access international climate finance. Thank, thank you very much, Samantha. Okay. I mean, again, for all participants, I mean, all this material is available uh, online, not only the paper, but again, a one page takeaway and a short video of three minutes uh, where all researchers had made the exercise of trying to summarize, uh, you know, their findings in, in, in very, uh, active and, and uh, uh, striking presentations. Now uh, we move to the to the to the last paper, uh, which is a paper that had been uh, produced by uh, uh, Harvey Himberg uh, from the Green Climate Fund, Kevin Gallagher from Boston University, and Jae Jun Su from INSEE. And this one is more focused on the climate change and and the role of development bank project cycles in in coping with this challenge for, for all financiers. I mean, the paper legitimately, uh, uh, in my opinion, is, is providing some critics uh, on development banks. So it's good to hear uh, the authors commenting that. Uh, I think, uh, Jajun, you are starting again? Uh, no, I'll be starting. Yeah, I'll start. uh, okay, sorry. Yeah. So Kevin, please go ahead. Okay, I have shared my screen, but I see the title screen here. Okay. Yes, we see your screen now. Everyone can see the full screen. Yeah, we can see it. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin Gallagher from the Global Development Policy Center at Boston University. I uh, really want to thank the AFD Ford Foundation, IDFC, uh, and obviously the folks at INSE at uh, Beida for coordinating this. I'm presenting this paper on behalf of my co-authors, uh, Harvey Hinberg from the GSF and Jia Jun Chu from INSE at, at Beida. I should say that um, uh, I think Jia Jun would agree with me that, that the two of us were sort of more in the played a guiding role on this one. And uh, Harvey Hinberg really did all of the heavy li lifting and research and unfortunately, at the last minute, some personal circumstances led to his uh, inability to be able to present and take part um, and uh, just let us know that very recently. So I did my best to do an, to uh, call through uh, an incredible deep dive that Harvey did. His, his paper 
probably wins the record from all the papers in these three days of being the longest one. It's over 23,000 words. And so this is my attempt to do this in eight slides and less than 15 minutes. Uh, in, in many respects, what we're trying to do in this paper is to trace the extent to which the very ambitious words that many uh, DFIs have made with respect to climate change have translated into action or have been mainstreamed in their balance sheet. At the One Planet Summit in, 2000 and, uh, in 2017, the IDFC and nine of the major multilateral development banks made a joint pledge uh, to redirect their financing consistent with Article 2.1 of the Paris Agreement. So we couldn't look at all of these different institutions, but we took a sample of five MDBs and five IDFC members um, to examine the extent to which uh, these institutions have incorporated these kind, this pledge throughout the project cycle. Uh, the five MDBs are on the left. Uh, we have both Southern-led and Western-led MDBs, AFD, EIB, and the World Bank Group, uh, in addition to the AIB and the CAF. I should say the CAF is a member of the multilateral development banks uh, consortiums, but also an IDFC member. Uh, with respect to IDFC members, uh, we look at the DBSA, JBIC, uh, Nacional Financiera in Mexico, uh, the PT Sarana Multi-Infrastructure Bank in Indonesia, and the KFW in Germany. Our basic research questions are to what extent have DFIs mainstream climate finance uh, into their project cycles. The three questions we really wanted to focus on in general uh, in particular, I guess, are climate risks to the project considered along with potential projects impacts on climate, which are two very separate things. Number two, what stages of the project cycle provide opportunities and challenges for mainstreaming with these different development finance institutions? And three, is there a significant difference between uh, the way the MDBs look at some of these things and IDFC members? This slide here uh, sort of gives you the realm of possibility. If you look in the first column, uh, we delineate different parts of the project cycle, very similarly to the way many of the development finance institutions do, separating into the screening, scoping, impact and risk assessment, management of environmental and social impact risks, uh, implementation component, and then monitoring and remediation. Okay, these are key parts that uh, diff obviously different DFIs have different stated project cycles, but uh, it's safe to say you can group them at least in these five categories. Uh, I'm going to skip to the far right column here and say, well, across our sample, what are the kinds of things that different banks are doing uh, at different parts of the, um, of the project cycle when it comes to screening? You have different uh, DFIs determining the scale of potential climate impact of the project and or the risk of climate change to the project. When it comes to scoping, that's when DFIs are looking to identify associated impacts that could generate climate impacts, assess project alternatives with respect to siting or different technologies that it could, could avoid climate impacts, uh, with risk assessment, uh, detailed assessment of climate related impacts and risk compared to baseline conditions. Uh, when it comes to the ESMP, or the preparation of environmental and social management plans, to what extent are climate laid imp impacts uh, part of that. And when it comes to monitoring and evaluation, uh, monitoring of project outputs and outcomes against climate related targets and monitoring parameters. So those are the different parts of the project cycle uh, and where you see climate change falling in uh, on some of them. Uh, again, um, Harvey's, Harvey's, uh, Harvey's work is, 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 uh, is immense, and I tried to distill it into just a handful of uh, uh, slides to compare across the different DFIs in our sample. Might raise more questions than answers, but if you take a look here at these five different parts of the, of the project cycle, first by looking at the MDBs, uh, you can see that the CAF and the World Bank uh, are the only two in our sample that uh, are incorporating climate change in every part of the project cycle as we defined it there, not fully in each one, uh, but they do have some part of uh, climate change addressing, uh, addressing that. Um, uh, the CAF and the World Bank are actually the only two, if I remember my next slide correctly, uh, that are looking at alternatives assessments, and I'll talk about that more in a second. Uh, this is the picture of what the IDFC members that we sample look like. Um, a lot less 
Uh, in, in this case, there isn't, uh, there isn't an IDFC member that's incorporating climate change through all parts of the, uh, of the project cycle. Let me just cut, try to cut to the chase um, and discuss the main findings across these uh, 10 different institutions. One is that multilateral development banks have less variation in, uh, across them with respect to their policies, with IDFC members having more variation. Now, I should say that that doesn't mean that MDBs, by any stretch of the imagination, are better on some of these issues. Some of them score much worse. Um, it's just that the language and what the policies look like across them are very similar, sometimes almost exactly the same. And that's because before climate change became a, a big issue for DFIs in general, the MDBs going back to the late 1980s have had a number of working groups to, uh, to look at other environmental issues uh, going back to the beginning of the safeguard days uh, and so forth. And so they have a built-in apparatus to share, uh, share best practices and compare. Uh, and often what happens is that the World Bank will be the first mover on a particular set of policies and then others will go and do variations of that. Again, not saying that the MDBs are better, but when you look at them, uh, the policies look very much the same. Um, whereas with the IDFC, at least in the members that we looked at, uh, there's a big variation in the different policies that they put together. Uh, DFIs perform, we find DFIs perform better in considering project impact on the climate, meaning to what extent will this particular coal plant imp impact climate change, rather than climate risks to projects. In other words, to what extent will this port redevelopment project uh, be susceptible to physical and, trans, uh, physical and transition risks uh, due to climate change itself. And one of the things that's, uh, that's quite surprising, especially relative to central banks and even now the IMF, uh, is that there's relatively cursory attention, if anything, to the full balance sheet analysis or stress tests uh, with respect to climate risks. We find that uh, one of the most encouraging things, and this was alluded to a little bit in the presentation by Samantha and Jia Jun, is that all the DFIs have dedicated programs to fund renewable energy and energy efficiency. However, not all have commitments to phase out fossil fuels and relatively fewer have targeted programs specific to adaptation. Uh, only two DFIs in the whole sample perform alternative analyses. So they might have an exclusionary list uh, for certain kinds of fossil fuels or through a risk assessment or an environmental impact assessment certain uh, climate risks might become flagged, um, but they don't have a build, built in uh, analysis that says, well, if this country is really looking to get uh, th 300 new megawatts in this particular region and this gas and coal uh, combination uh, is, is going to be susceptible to a number of risks and accentuate climate change, uh, what would an analysis be, say social cost of carbon accounting and so forth that, uh, that might help uh, get the country the megawatts that it needs uh, in a more climate friendly manner. Only the World Bank and the, and the CAF are uh, really baking that into their project cycles. Um, we find that the, the, throughout the project cycle, uh, the most conducive, uh, where you see the most, uh, the most incorporation of climate change is through the screening, scoping, risk analysis, and impact analysis components of the project cycle. Whereas stakeholder consultation and accountability mechanisms are politically, excuse me, particularly, although also politically challenging for all DFIs, interesting pun, um, largely because of the, uh, the, the way the legal documents on uh, stakeholder consultation and accountability mechanisms are set up, uh, they all center around standing and causal relationships. So if you're going to file a grievance uh, and engage in stakeholder consultations, you need to be have particular standing, which is usually being very proximate to a particular project. Um, and you have to show a causal relationship between something happening at that project and the issue that you're working on. So obviously the marginal impact is a hard, hard to sometimes, especially for a local community or a national think tank to establish a causal relationship between one plant and all of global climate change. Um, and obviously it's difficult for say a hurricane or, or a natural disaster might, that might hurt a particular community in a project um, to uh, often that project itself had nothing to do with that natural disaster that happened. And so it uh, faces legal challenges. It's very challenging to, uh, to incorporate that. 
Uh, we find a lack of transparency across all, all sets of uh, DFIs. There's actually a couple that we had to, we wanted to put on our list, but we couldn't because you just really can't get access to the documents, to the policies, and to the uh, and to their performance. I should say that our, our methodology was that what Harvey did was get the actual policy documents from every single one of the banks that he could, um, and then followed up with uh, semi-structured interviews with the folks who were in charge of those different things. Uh, finally, we find that few DFIs have targeted programs on adjustment. Uh, obviously, in a climate transition, there are going to be winning firms and winning uh, and losing firms. There's going to be uh, workers in uh, winning sectors and workers in losing sectors, um, and there's very little attention uh, in DFIs on that kind of adjustment to make a just transition to make sure that the uh, older firms can remain competitive in some way, or if they have to fall by the wayside over the long run to have an adjustment program so that those firms and the people who work there can move into the new and more dynamic in, uh, industries. So a few, uh, whoops, a few uh, a few policy recommendations. Uh, obviously, the Finance and Commons Summit is a real opportunity here. And one of the things that we find uh, through these important aspirational commitments in 2017, that it's important to move beyond aspiration to concrete action and actual cooperation. Obviously, we started this whole effort and endeavor before the COVID uh, crisis hit the global economy. And it's now cl clear more than ever that emerging market and developing countries need a massive injection of uh, new capital and incredible amounts of fiscal space to be able to attack the virus, protect the vulnerable, and make this green transition. The COVID economic crisis cannot be the excuse to put these goals on hold. As a matter of fact, they really need to be the excuse to accelerate this transition. And we have to come to terms with the fact that that's gonna require new capital increases for green and inclusive recovery and development finance institutions need to be part of this central part, uh, especially in the early years of the COVID recovery when the, when the private sector is gonna be uh, riddled with uncertainty and reluctant to lead. We recommend uh, joint commitments on de-risking DFI balance sheets and accelerating just transitions, recognizing that there should be common and differentiated responsibilities. Uh, the responsibilities for the development bank in South Africa would be very different than the KFW in Germany or the World Bank. Uh, we recommend that the DFIs work together to improve transparency and accountability. Uh, they, in 2014, 2015, the IDFC and the MDBs worked together to come up with an accounting system for green finance, but while the, the, the separately they uh, report on these things at very aggregated levels of detail, um, and it would be uh, important to build on that, uh, but also to be transparent about uh, different policies uh, and making data more freely available to third parties to be able to hold, uh, hold these institutions accountability to make sure that they are living up to their goals. There needs to be a new focus on adjustment uh, on the co-benefits when you can get improvements on climate change and health uh, and inequality those kinds of policies should be prioritized. Um, firms are going to fall by the wayside in this transition. Real people work in those firms. Those firms are important for fiscal balance sheets of governments and for financial balance sheets of the financial system. And so we really need to focus on the adjustment. And of, cor of course, we know the private sector uh, leaves people behind by its very nature. Of, there's a really important role for DFIs to play in just transitions. And that this summit uh, is, shouldn't be the last uh, time that all of these institutions get together. It really should be the beginning of starting to act as a system. For too long, development finance has focused on the October and April meetings in and around the IMF and the World Bank, which is very US-centered and focused on MDBs. What we see here uh, next week with the FIC is that we're gonna have just uh, orders of magnitude more banks, all uh, with their own set of goals that need to be talking with each other on uh, equal footing uh, with open, uh, open arms and, and open ears. And we hope over time that DFIs can cooperate on best practice, put together more project preparation and co-financing platforms and joint reporting, and think ambitiously about joint action on one of the most pressing issues of our time. Thanks so much. 
Well, thank you very much, Kevin. And you've kept the, the time really. Uh, you were sharp as usual. <laughs> Many thanks. So this uh, leaves us um, uh, a little bit of time uh, to go into uh, some questions from, from discussions. Uh, before turning to uh, discussions that were uh, pre-selected out of the panel, I would like to uh, turn to um, our, our good colleague, um, uh, uh, Alice, uh, who has asked a question on, on the chat system. And I think it's better, Alice, if you, if you uh, ask your question directly. Uh, so please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I'll try to be um, precise. So as you know, the, the project cycle is in part influenced by country level strategic discussions uh, between either DMDB or DNDB with the, borrow, the borrowing countries. Uh, and I was wondering when you looked at project cycles, uh, did you also look at the uh, strategic level discussions, such as in the World Bank, you know, country partnership frameworks, uh, to look at whether there was this uh, a good synergy between both, and whether then the type of influence these country level strategic discussions had on uh, the integration of climate within the project cycle? Um, Kevin, you have an answer on that? Yeah, how should we proceed? I, I, we, if folks can just uh, answer individual questions. Well, not every, not every one of the banks in our sample has that kind of a framework, right? Uh, obviously, the, the World Bank does, um, but the way that the different MDBs, and especially, obviously, many of the IDFC um, members are national in their own sense, and so they don't have that same kind of framework. So it wasn't a core part, uh, core part, of, part of the analysis. Thank you very much, Sebastian. You also want to uh, complement the answer? No, I'm not sure I want to complement Kevin's answer, but just to say that uh, <clears throat> one of the things that I think Maria Alexandra has talked about is the idea that beyond project cycle assessment, there was the issue of discussing portfolio alignment with Agenda 2030, particularly when it comes to Agenda 2030, when you look to align with climate and other SDGs. And in that regard, national level country dialogue is something that we, I think we insist on as something that still needs to be built. So that's not contrary to what Kevin has been saying, but something that I think yeah. is still ahead of us and that some of the banks sure. do, uh, do, do, do are actually doing. Thank sure, you. as I said uh, that in my main findings in, uh, in, our, in our sample, uh, that's, a, that's a, big, a bit of a glaring omission. And uh, it's really an area where even though uh, DFIs can be credited for having a much longer history, thinking about the environment in general and climate in particular, it's sort of amazing that the central banks have come out of uh, come out of nowhere and are really looking at a uh, at a full set of uh, uh, climate risks in the entire balance sheet, but the DFIs aren't very much. And uh, not only do the DFIs have to look at the at the exposure of their balance sheet, but since DFIs do a lot of policy uh, give policy loans about policy design, they're also very concerned about uh, the fiscal sustainability of a country, its ability to generate its own and mobilize its own domestic finance for transitions like this. Um, and an area where the DFIs really need to move into are fiscal stress tests, right? Central banks do, finance, to what extent does, is your financial system exposed to different climate risks? However, obviously a development bank should be much more focused on or additionally focused on to what extent does your national tax system which might be heavily exposed to fossil fuels uh, and be a key source of revenue. Uh, one of our uh, banks in the sample is Nathan from Mexico. Well, they don't, Mexico only has about 20 years of proven uh, oil reserves, but the national budget, 40% of the national budget for in all of Mexico's, uh, uh, all of Mexico's uh, fiscal, fiscal policy, 40% of it comes just from the state-owned oil company. Uh, and it's oil exports. That is, uh, that is grave when you consider uh, long-term development prospects. Um, and so the, the DFIs need to catch up with the central banks, but then they need to take that concept and move into the fiscal space as well. Thank you very much. I think this is a very uh, useful compliment. And thank you for that uh, right question, Alice. Can I turn now uh, the, the floor to uh, uh, Stefan Lindner of the ASEAN Infrastructure Development Banks, 
uh, who also um, wanted, if I'm right, to uh, uh, have some comments on the papers. Stefan? Well, I'd just like to comment on the last paper. Uh, I'd like to comment on the last paper, which was just presented, uh, which is the one I looked at. Uh, one of the things I think is very useful is the paper does provide a very comprehensive overview of the types of measures that are being used uh, by the sampled banks. The one thing though, is that it can only be seen as a snapshot. Things are changing very, very fast. So for example, in the last uh, month, you've had the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank approve its corporate strategy. You've also had a decision made by the president uh, that they will not be financing uh, the use of, that they will not be financing uh, coal-fired uh, facilities. So I think that is important. We need to see this as a very dynamic situation in terms of what types of environmental and social policies more broadly and what types of approaches are being used for environmental and social assessment of the uh, multilateral development banks uh, in particular. The other thing is what I like about the document, but I think it needs to be brought out more, is that there is a lot more work being done on the management of risks associated uh, with impact assessment. And I think that needs to be brought out because I think that's a place where at the uh, level of the use of the environment and social assessment instrument, you can have a lot more impact. Uh, I think the other thing we need to recognize, and this came into some of the comments uh, more broadly we just heard, uh, when you're looking at these institutions, I think we need to look at the important role the policies and strategies play in framing up what they do, as well as the instruments like the environment and social assessment are used to look at specific investment programs or specific investments themselves. Uh, those are the points I'd like to make right now. Thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, we also, I think, have a, a, a comment from, from Gaia Larsen from uh, uh, WRI, uh, which is connected with us. Gaia, do you want to uh, make a, a short comment too? Yes, hi. Um, thank you. Thanks for in inviting me to this interesting meeting. Um, and yes, I. I, I like Stephen read the last paper, so uh, that would be the one that I um, paid most attention to. And I actually had similar comments to Stephen in that um, I think the question about really the adaptation side of the spectrum um, is in some ways the most complicated, right? How do development banks deal with the fact that adaptation is so specific to the context and it's so specific to the type of activities uh, the region, the, really including the culture uh, sometimes. Um, and so I do think the paper did mention uh, the fact that, for example, uh, the national development banks, I guess, according to the analysis on the paper, were better at this. And I found that to be an interesting statement, uh, considering that I know the multilateral banks have spent quite a bit of time, at least thinking, trying to think about well, how did we deal with uh, risk assessments when it comes and well, risk assessments and implementation uh, of projects in a way that that considers uh, the adaptation side of the climate um, question. So, I would have loved to have heard a little bit more about why um, the authors felt that the national development banks were doing better on this, and then uh, you know some examples of how this was happening. Uh, in, in terms of implementation, um, what were what were some of the lessons in implementation that the banks were learning, and why is it that the um, authors feel that the national banks are doing better on this than than the multilaterals? Uh, a second comment that I had, uh, well, well, just actually one thing quickly first was that uh, I did. Um, Kevin mentioned the fact that it was difficult to include some banks because they simply didn't have their documentation available. And we at WRI have had this problem in the past as well. And it, it's it's unfortunate because then uh, it almost rewards banks for not <laughs> putting out their documentation in the sense that 
uh, they don't get the same type of scrutiny because it's just very, very difficult to scrutinize um, something where you don't where you don't see the documents or don't have the information. So I, I joined Kevin in kind of encouraging uh, the community to make sure that all the banks that are operating in this space are are more op are open with uh, the policies that they are using and also where they are investing. I think, I think that the multilateral banks have had pressure in this regard for a long time, uh, for decades, and so they've become quite good at, at least some of them, I would say the World Bank in particular, at being uh, transparent about what are their policies, what are the programs that they're investing in, or the projects they're investing in. And it would be great, I think, if we could encourage uh, the national banks to do the same. And then uh, finally, a brief comment on the issue of stakeholder engagement. I found it interesting that in the paper, there was a fair amount of discussion about the fact that in the rules around uh, stakeholder engagement, they focus mostly on process and less around the fact that stakeholder engagement should involve climate uh, discussions. And then yes, also the fact that it as Kevin mentioned, it is sometimes difficult uh, when it comes to stakeholder engagement and especially around accountability mechanisms when it comes to climate because the uh, impacts of climate may, be, uh, may come about after the, the banks have left and our accountability mechanisms are no longer, um, no longer active or the impact of climate is, uh, is emissions and not necessarily emissions that will directly impact those project, those impacted by the project because it's say CO2 emissions and it doesn't necessarily cause health impact. But on the global scale, it has, a, it has an impact and, and it's not possible really to bring a, a complaint to the complaint mechanism, accountability mechanisms, uh, just sort of at the global scale um, without, you know, there being some sort of uh, a direct impact, which and without person having standing, um, having been directly impacted. So I do think that, um, you know, it's, it's useful to have a conversation around how do you use, how do you make policies that are um, ones that you can use in accountability mechanisms to help enforce? And, uh, you know, is it the case, for example, that uh, stakeholder engagement processes, because I think they, it was implied in the paper that perhaps they weren't that useful because in terms of climate, because they weren't, um, they didn't specifically mention climate change in, in the rules and policies. But I wonder a bit if that's the case because at the same time, especially again on the adaptation side of things, you're really going to need to engage with stakeholders to understand what the adaptation measures may be um, for that particular context. And you're not, and so it seems that if you are really going to be as a bank incorporating climate adaptation and the effects of climate um, on the project and on the project beneficiaries or those affected by the project, you're gonna to need to discuss it quite thoroughly with, with uh, people on the ground and be quite um, open and engaging with them. Uh, so anyway, that was, um, you know, I think, valuable that the paper brought up, brought up the issue of climate and, and stakeholders and it, it could be a space for, I think, further um, further exploration. Those are my thoughts. Um, thanks Thank again. you very much. Thank you very much, Gaia. I don't know, uh, Kevin, Kajun, if you want to uh, uh, give a very short, brief answer to that because we also have uh, other questions in the chat. So it would be nice as we have only five minutes left or we're even out of the time. Thank you give quick answer, please. Yeah, super quick. Uh, to underscore what Stephen said, uh, these banks are changing all the time. When you know, when you're done with the first draft, the EIB hadn't uh, made its groundbreaking uh, policy changes, and the DBSA has made some new groundbreaking ones. And as we know, all of the banks are now thinking about what their green recovery strategy is. And so, this document by the end of this meeting uh, might be a light year behind. Um, 
why are the NDBs, uh, do we find them to be more uh, adaptation uh, friendly than some of the MDBs? It could be a sample thing. It could be uh, because NAFIN and the DBSA struggle with uh, adaptation and, and it's an issue that they, uh, the countries do. It's an issue that the banks um, really want to focus on, but it also might be due to the transparency problem, which is that um, the, those firms just, excuse me, those DFIs just have better, uh, better documentation that Harvey was able to put together. Very last and very quick, but very important, is that in no way did the paper say that uh, accountability mechanisms aren't useful. Uh, we were diplomatically saying that the DFIs are challenged with this, uh, but, and they have to rethink some of these issues around standing and causality uh, to make sure that consultation and accountability are a core component of uh, de designing climate strategies and DFIs. Thanks. Thank you, Kevin. Well, in the chat, we have a, a very interesting uh, question for Jejun and for Samantha, uh, coming from Daniel Goya, who is connected from Chile. Uh, Daniel, do you want to ask your question directly? That would be probably easier. Daniel, are you there? Can you connect? Okay, while Daniel is connecting, the question for you, Jajun, is that uh, in your speech, you have mentioned technical expertise as an advantage for development bank. But the question is, how do you build this uh, expertise, uh, which is, uh, which must be, ah, Daniel is there. So please, Daniel, go Thanks. ahead. Yeah, there may be a bit boring, very narrow question, not about the big issue, but uh, Jujan, you mentioned technical expertise. And if you think of developing countries that see these institutions as a way to transform their mix, their, their sectors and develop new ones, you don't necessarily have those capabilities. And maybe you can have them if you have a more, vertically oriented bank that says we're going to focus on this sector so they can build technical capability in one sector and not in everything and even if you decide to have capacities in in that specific sector it's not that easy to build if you don't have those sectors and technologies in the country and for samantha i'm wondering things about the exchange rate risk especially in, i mean in chile we have completely floating free rate that just jumps up and down all the time so i would like to know if there's anything work that has been done about the interaction of the exchange rate regime and the way the development banks can work and about currency i mean domestic lending and domestic currency i'm not sure if it would be a solution for everything because in some cases you might just transfer the risk to the borrower and um, that i just try to make it quick thank you very much daniel mm -hmm. uh, good question we start with jejun if you can uh, quickly answer jejun and then samantha Well, sure. Thank you very much for the question. In terms of the expertise, I think it's a necessity for DFIs to build expertise because they are very different from commercial banks. When they try to select project for investment, what they care about is not simply, you know, risk return. They need to care about, you know, they need to uh, to understand the prospect of certain sectors. Maybe these sectors may be new to the country. So in the case, in terms of the feasibility of building the expertise, in the case of CBB, maybe it's a little bit special because CBB inherit the six investment companies when CBB was, was established in 1994. So this may be special to China, but I think for other countries, for other NDBs, they can proactively try to incubate their expertise and to ensure that they can uh, make investment, you know, by taking into account the system level the impact of, of their investment. Okay. Yeah. Samantha? Thank you, Daniel, for your questions. Um, so just quickly, no, we didn't, the study didn't look at the interaction of kind of different exchange rate regimes and DFI kind of um, responses in relation to that. So that's the first answer, I'm afraid. The, se the second answer in terms of pushing kind of uh, local currency lending and pushing that onto the borrower, borrower I think firstly, we just need to uh, distinguish a few things. The first thing is, obviously, there's a difference when we're talking about project level investment, uh, where there is often a mismatch in currency because much of the technology is imported, particularly in, uh, pardon the expression, uh, developing countries but the revenue is, is denominated in, in local currency. So for many countries, there, there will be this, this mismatch when the technology is not 
not homegrown. Um, and then there's the, the mismatch on the balance sheet of the DFI itself. And there it's important to distinguish between multilateral development finance institutions and national development finance institutions. So, so the idea about more local currency lending is from the multilaterals to do more of that. And they, I, I, in my opinion, they are well placed to do that because they have such large portfolios and they, they're much better placed to kind of diversify the risk, um, because currencies, as you know, kind of like move in many, many different ways. Um, so um, I think, so I think the local, more local currency lending is important. Um, uh, it's not a definitive solution, but I would definitely think that MDFI should do much more of it. I don't have the figures to hand. They don't, they, as I say, they lend in small amounts of, of local currency. It's, it's very, very limited. And hedging is very expensive and it only exists where there's swap markets. And in my opinion, there is a role for multilaterals, as I say, with the size of their balance sheets, and diversification, um, but also their access, if you like, to concessional finance to be able to subsidize that cost of hedging rather than pushing that on to the national development finance institution or pushing that further down onto the project, which can be a deal breaker. As Kath said, no one really wants to borrow in US dollars in Brazil. Thank you, Samantha. I just want Thank to mention will. that uh, uh, we, we're going to, 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 to close the debate here because uh, we will have a session that is, I think, if I'm right, uh, uh, day after tomorrow, there is a paper that has been prepared specifically on balance of payments and exchange risks, uh, which will address some of these issues. So uh, uh, now as, as, as a conclusion, we were to have uh, also uh, uh, some comments from Samantha and from uh, um, on, on the first paper. And uh, I wonder whether we can do that in maybe 30 seconds each, Sam and Kevin. Uh, your 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 main comments, striking comments on the first paper. Sam, you can you can Samantha, you can you can continue, but please okay. thirty seconds. Okay, your, I'll be your, your three I'll be points. Very, okay, <laughs> three 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 points. Um, I was struck by the observation around, if you like, the kind of stagnation in the, if you like, in the lending in relation to the equity of these institutions. And I, and I was wondering actually how much of that is a reflection in the change in the kind of way that these banks do business, i.e. traditionally that they've been kind of, you know, public financiers of investment rather than mobilizers. Um, because the figures that you use or the paper you use just looks at the, the, the depth um, lending of the DFIs, it doesn't look at the actual mobilization. Uh, so you might see potentially a different picture or something changing over time. That was my first, that was my first observation. Um, I was also struck by the fact that there is this kind of um, uh, less conservative uh, lending, if you like, kind of by the national DFIs. Again, I wonder, if that's a reflection actually that many of these DFIs, and we found this in Africa, the paper we'll be presenting tomorrow, have very small balance sheets. So actually they have quite large leverage numbers because uh, the um, denominator is so small. So I'm also wondering, it might not be, I'm, when I think about risk, I think about kind of obviously the sectors or different kinds of instruments, uh, not necessarily kind of the, the, the leverage ratio, if, if you like. So. I wonder how much of it is to do with the size of the balance sheets of these institutions. And then finally, my final observation um, or reflection is this, we talk about transformative change. And I think there's an implied kind of uh, assumption that, you know, if these banks align to the SDGs, we're gonna see transformative change. <coughs> but transformation to, in my mind implies a structural change in the economy. And we talk about kind of market creation and to me, that requires kind of much more strategic, uh, top-down kind of uh, state intervention kind of investment to create markets. And I just wonder this kind of the alignment of SDGs and mainstreaming, you know, the, the sum of DFI investment often is, is more than the sum of its parts. And I kind of worry, if you like, I worry that we need to kind of stand back and think about the actual kind of real transformative change that we want and the holistic strategy. Mm -hmm required rather than kind of trying to 
align and map onto SDGs. Uh, but that's, I've got other comments, as you know, but uh, those are my three main ones. Mm, thank you, Samantha. Uh, maybe before um, uh, Sebastian and Maria are given a chance to quickly answer. Kevin, in a snapshot, your three points. Great paper, point number one. Uh, point number two, I just put a, uh, a paper that we did and published in the Journal of International Development uh, on similar topics. I just want to uh, emphasize that the, 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 the paper or maybe the presentation implies that uh, perhaps NDBs are more frivolous and MDBs are less so. What we show in our paper is that actually the MDBs are, and this uh, uh, dovetails with things that we'll hear from Lavinia uh, later, uh, are overly conservative. Uh, we find that MDBs could increase their lending uh, up to $800 billion without jeopardizing their AAA. Um, which is really important. So it's not that uh, NDBs are frivolous and MDBs are doing the right thing. It's the MDBs are way off in an over -conserv overly conservative manner with their, with their respective balance sheets. Mm -hmm. uh, and the NDBs are, uh, are maximizing they, what, uh, what they can with what they have. Many thanks, Kevin. So Sebastian, can you, can you answer also very quickly as we are out of schedule already? Or Maria, I don't know. Sorry, I, ju I just wanted to, uh, uh, Maria has uh, probably more precise answers, but I think the, 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 the very big question asked by uh, Samantha is extremely important. It's not because we transform uh, the National Development Banks to be drivers of change towards Agenda 2030 that it would happen. And maybe we need to really make sure to have a step back and to understand how countries and the, the whole ecosystem of a country and first and foremost the government is implementing uh, the, what is necessary to go towards uh, the, the, uh, the achievement of Agenda 2030 in the country. What we're implying is actually that if this is done then the National Development Bank can be a very useful uh, tool for that to be aligned and I think that gets back to the idea of having a national scale dialogue on public policies and on the role of the National Development Bank. But that's a very important discussion that Samantha is opening and I don't think we have time to, mm. to really give no, a, no, we, a final we answer to that. I agree, I agree. I agree, quite important. Maria, your conclusion in three words. Uh, no, just to thank both peer reviewers for their comments. I think we have a lot of uh, things that we could uh, discuss upon the questions uh, asked by Samantha. Just to briefly say that we decided to focus on uh, lending because, um, as I said, it's the main instrument of, of public development banks and uh, it's the instrument that has uh, information on uh, their balance sheets. We didn't uh, take into account of balance sheets uh, work of public development banks, sadly, because uh, there's uh, relative uh, low access to this information to be able to compare all the banks in our sample. So some of them have information for certain years, some others don't. So in order to be able to really make a comparison, uh, we, we decided to really focus on, on the most uh, used and powerful instrument in their balance sheets. But uh, for sure, if we were able to assess uh, how public development banks are mobilizing additional funds, for example, through co-financing, the, the assessment uh, should uh, provide very interesting results in terms of the capacity that I think uh, public development banks have still untapped. And uh, we will be able to assess the, the, the big contribution that they can have in terms of supporting sustainable development on the ground. But we can have this discussion later on um, if, if uh, both periods were swap, because I think yeah, we don't have- that is, that, is over, that is opening very interesting path for our research in 2021, I'm sure. <laughs> now, uh, I don't want to close the session without giving uh, uh, the floor to Christopher. Uh, who uh, also have some 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 comments to share on the on the paper number two on energy, Christopher? You know we're running out of time. Sorry for that. Uh, be super really fast. Tight schedule. If you can make it in in again, very efficient and and, and clear way. Sure. No, I already passed my comments to the authors on paper two. Great paper. Would just say one other issue that is not really addressed in that paper is how to push DFIs more to take more risk. They don't take enough risk. EBRD, IFC, they're all deal makers. They wanna take deals and they often crowd out impact investors. 
And there's incentives, there's reasons why they do that, uh, very concrete reasons. Uh, but we need to find ways as public policy people to push them to take more risks. And I think that's key uh, because they're taking deals that inv impact investors would also like to take their competing. Right now, I know I speak to impact investors a lot and uh, their biggest competitors are the BFIs, uh, which is a bit <laughs> ridiculous. Um, so that needs to change. Uh, a couple of quick points on the first paper, which also is very interesting. The issue about uh, uh, equity to loans ratios, uh, there's reasons behind that. Uh, there's reasons why national development banks can do eight times, whereas MDBs can only do two times. And it has a lot to do with where they get their money. Uh, do they access markets? Do they get budget money? Do they have uh, tied money linked to certain things in the markets where they, where they can access it? That has a lot to do with how they manage their capital adequacy. So it's, you can't just, I would be cautious about just saying, be less conservative, because there's real reasons behind why they are acting the way they are. Uh, and the last thing came up in two papers, project preparation funds. Wonderful, everyone knows that. We all need project preparation funds. The question is who's gonna pay for it? Uh, and the institutions that have been able to pay for it are the ones that are able to generate net income and they can use their net income to create these funds. Uh, the World Bank, these big MDBs. Uh, and that's why the national development banks, especially the ones that have to depend on more expensive funding, which makes their loans more expensive, which makes it more difficult to generate net income, they're less able to do that. So we gotta be a little bit more creative and thinking about how we can set up project preparations funds. Cause I agree, they're, they're absolutely essential. And I will stop right there. Thank you very much. Well, Christopher, thank you. That was short, but uh, impactful. <laughs> Many thanks for, for that. Okay, so um, we are now going to close the session a, bit, a little bit ahead of time. Uh, what, what the programs entails is now uh, a short break of five minutes, so we can all uh, take time for a, a coffee or, 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 or whatever. And then Stephanie uh, will take over in five minutes for uh, session number uh, two, uh, uh, and um, which, which uh, also uh, will present two papers and, and we'll have a discussion uh, session. Okay, so... Um, Thank you to uh, all of you. Thank you to uh, uh, all the researchers that have presented their papers and to the very interesting comments uh, that we benefited and uh, see you in five minutes. Hi, Stephanie, how are you? I'm good, I'm good, I like your point. Thank you. How have you been, where are you? Are you in? Uh, I'm in, in England. In I Brighton been or in London? In Brighton. Oh, very Brighton. nice, very nice. And go for nice walks by the sea. Yeah, 
that's all we do is go on walks in the forest nowadays. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no point being in London. You can't go to the theater or the cinema. No, or the... exactly. It's the only the downside, not the upside. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's going well, this um, workshop, isn't it? Say that again? I think this workshop is going well. I'm pleased. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I'm unfortunately probably going to have to duck out. I have some more work I have to do writing a paper about the MDBs and capital adequacy, actually. Oh, wow. Send it to me when you, yeah, when you do. Be, actually, yeah. I was thinking of you because um, there's this guy, Jamie, Jamie something, um, sort of ngo guy. He works with Vera Songwe, and he was asking, because I'm always proposing that they should increase their capital, mm. and he was saying by how much. Right. I got that email forwarded from yeah. Dirk. Okay, great. Yeah, um, that's what we're writing the paper about. Excellent. Yeah. I think they want to make some statement before the G20. Yeah, the problem is that the shareholders are not going to, they're not going to increase capital anytime soon. Yeah. They did after the global financial crisis. I know, crisis. but it's a different world now. And uh, yeah. Mm. And uh, anyways, it wouldn't come soon enough. I mean, the question, that, I mean, I'm going to definitely say that they're going to need to in the medium term, but question is what do we do next year i mean what do we do in the coming months they're running out of money mm. uh so yeah, yeah. yeah. Very serious. christopher are you in paris i see the roof behind you <laughs> it looks like a parisian it's rather friend. parisian doesn't it no it's uh, yeah. zurich i live in zurich, zurich. oh okay yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nice sort of an off-brand paris if you will <laughs> no nice you know your point on um, on how we select our deals yeah uh, i also have 30 years of practice you know in the field uh, countries like Mexico, in Africa, et cetera. We are all fighting what? for the good deals. No, we are all fighting for the good deals. Yeah. I mean, whenever no, you have a good deal in Kenya or Uganda or whatever, you don't want to miss it. You don't want to oh, leave it to private sector because you need it in your balance sheet. Exactly. Maybe. I mean, there's personal yeah. incentives on the part of the staff. Exactly. <laughs> and and we, are, we are kept responsible for the public funds that are being given to us. It's so, the split yeah. mandate. That's the issue. Yeah. I mean, they have exactly. a financial mandate and they have a developmental mandate and they are exactly. often in conflict, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. And so we are after the good deals, yeah. obviously. No, and I mean, I, my wife works for, and you know, responsibility. Mm. It's an impact investment firm. They do a lot of uh, renewable energies and emerging markets. And they say, yeah, they're competing with AFD, they're competing with FMO. Those are their competitors. Mm -hmm. And it's quite mm -hmm. sad. I mean, the, the DFIs need to shift more to the risk and open up that space because it's a dynamic space. Yeah, but it's becoming more exactly. and more marketable. So right. are more and more inclined as, to go as there. As we say in our paper, like real economy risks, not, not some of this fancy financial engineering. Yeah, yeah, but no. the problem is that when you when you increase your risk, you need somebody to take that it. In and we don't have the, the kind of balance sheet. We have we have we have a, development banks balance sheets and we leverage money. <laughs> we also borrow in the markets. So it would means that uh, we would need. So DFIs need to be AAA. I don't think I don't think they do. You know, they can be very very good at double A. Gentlemen, you know, we're about to start. Stop, stop. Barbara's <laughs> telling me that we're about to start. Okay, okay. sorry, okay. I'll shut up. Yeah. Anyways, sorry, yes. I'm gonna have to cut off partway through. So nice to chat with you guys. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, sorry about that. So Stephanie, you are you are taking over, right? Yeah. So I understand that we're now Look. starting again. Um, and I would like to, uh, we have now a session from, on financial regulation. Um, I wanted first to say that I thought the previous session was brilliant, both the, the papers, the presentations, and, and the discussion was very rich. So I'm very thrilled as co-organizer of this initiative at the high quality of the event till now. Um, and I think we're getting broader points also. I, I, I thought the point that Samantha and others made about how we need to locate um, development banks in the broad context of, of a structural change that we want, not just focusing on specific uh, SDGs, but also thinking of the major structural transformations that are essential for the economy. Um, I thought that kind of points that are emerging are really important. So in terms of this um, session, we will be focusing on financial regulation. Uh, as you know, uh, financial regulation is always born out of crises. And the focus, of course, is 
financial stability of a private financial system. But the fact that we now have climate crisis and we have the challenges of the SDGs um, means that we have to think of ways that financial regulation, whilst continuing to preserve the financial stability of financial institutions, has to also make this compatible uh, with SDG complementarity. Um, and also in particular, um, and I'm thinking here of a second paper um, with correct carbon pricing. Um, so, and, and the broader question here is, can regulation be modified, for example, in ways to help sufficient private finance to be channeled to mitigate and adapt to climate change? And what is the, uh, if you like, the compatibility with the work that will be done by the public development banks? So the two specific research questions, as you can see, are what is the appropriate regulatory framework for NDBs, for development banks? What, to what extent does Basel III uh, complement uh, the work of development banks? Or does it challenge, if you like, uh, the development impact, the sustainable development impact that NDBs have? And I think very interestingly, should there be a separately a international agreed regulatory framework um, for M NDBs? And the second also important question is to what extent and how should financial regulation take into account financial risks? So we, we're gonna have two papers. The first one we, is presented by, is written by Ricardo Gotchak, initially from IDS, then from UNCTAD, and now the UN in South Africa. Uh, second co-author is Lavinia Barros de Castro, um, who is a senior colleague at BENDES, the Development Bank of Brazil, and also an academic. And of course, Jajun, whom we all know, a vice dean at INSE. And the second paper is presented by Ulrich Hege, and Frédéric Charbonnier, and they are both from the Toulouse School of Economics. They're both professors there, and, um, and uh, Ulrich is also vice president there. And then we will have two excellent commentators, uh, Andrew Walter from Australia, and Uli Volz from SOAS in London, where he directs uh, a, a new center that he helped create on sustainable finance. So without further ado, I would like now to ask um, uh, Ricardo Lavinia and Jajun to present their paper. You have 15 minutes and please put on your cameras when you speak. I was asked to tell you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Hello, Stephanie. Thank you, Chair. How are you? Uh, it's very nice to be here with you again. Uh, so what we're doing today is to discuss the following paper. Uh, it's titled uh, Financial Regulation of National Development Banks. Oh, please, uh, I'll share my, my, my presentation, right? Why not? Okay, can you see my presentation? Yes. Yeah, okay, so as I, was, uh, as I was saying, so what we're doing today, we're going to discuss, discuss the paper uh, titled Financial Regulation of National Development Banks, uh, which uh, was prepared by three authors, by Lavinia Barros de Castro from Benidesz, by Jia Junju from the Institute of New Structure Economics, and by myself, Ricardo Gautzo from the UN. And this is a paper that actually we presented last June uh, in a workshop uh, that was organized jointly by AFT and the Institute of New Structure Economics. And between then and now, what we did was to try to revise the paper, to improve the paper, and, and to incorporate the very valuable comments that we got from our reviewers, from Andrew Walter, 
who I think he's not there today with us, but he sent a recorded message and by Samuel uh, Aronovich. So we're not presenting really the whole paper as we did last time. What we're doing now is really to try to focus on those questions that we think important for future research. Uh, but having said that, uh, yes, I'm going to talk very briefly about some aspects of the paper. So what I'm doing and what we are doing, uh, the three of us, is first to say what the paper does, uh, just to remind uh, the audience what we think the main tasks of national development banks are, uh, what uh, Basel III standards may have a negative impact on national development banks, then just to go quickly through the main concerns that the paper, the preliminary version of the paper raises, and then what suggestions it gives going forward. And then we open for, we come up with, with key discussion, key questions for discussion and for future research, okay? So that's the idea of the presentation. So uh, what the paper does is to explore the impacts of Basel III. Basel III is the regulatory framework in response to the global financial crisis, okay? So what we do is to uh, explore the impacts of this regulatory framework on national development banks. And the key question is to what extent Basel III inhibits the ability of national development banks to fulfill the missions. Now, just a quick recap uh, for the audience, what we think national uh, tasks we think are important um, regarding national development banks. First, it's important that they land at scale and that's a very important, so they land big at scale. And that's a very important task in the context of the SDGs because we want development banks to finance the SDGs. Then uh, another important task is to provide long-term finance. Why? Because if you look at commercial banks, they do provide long-term finance, but what they do is not sufficient. So we need development banks to, to do that. Then uh, we expect the volume banks, and they do, to finance infrastructure projects, which in general are large projects, complex projects. We also expect banks, the volume banks, to support innovation, including uh, climate finance, and to provide a counter-cyclical lending. I think Stephanie mentioned that um, a few minutes ago about counter-cyclical lending, uh, which is really important in time of crisis, such as the time we our experience, experience ex, uh, witnessing now, which is the COVID-19 crisis, okay? Uh, now, if you look at the Basel standards, uh, we'll see that several of these standards may have an adverse impact on NDBs. Uh, I'll just mention a couple of them. The first one is the higher capital requirements, and that's uh, it, it does have an impact on development banks because that can constrain the ability to, to land at scale. Then we have large exposures framework and that again has an impact on these banks because these banks usually when you look at their portfolio of, of assets, they have large projects. Then we have uh, changes that have been introduced uh, to um, to determine uh, capital for operational risk, uh, there have been changes and these changes may imply more capital requirements, which again is problematic for these banks because we expect them to lend at scale. And finally, another point I want to, hi I want to highlight is the fact that if you look at Basel III, uh, they do not really uh, incentivize banks to take risks in connection with innovation, on the contrary. There is a, uh, they discourage that to happen, to take risks in connection with, with innovation, including in climate finance. And that again is a problem because we're expecting these banks to be able to support the transition to a green economy. Um, okay, so what sort of concerns do we raise uh, in the paper, at least on a preliminary basis, we may ch change. Uh, first, that the framework, the Basel framework, it comes with excessive risk controls. That's a problem for, for those banks. And, and the framework can affect, as I said, the ability to play the future developmental role. 
Uh, then one big issue for the large banks, not the small banks, but the large development banks, the fact that uh, for certain risk, credit risk exposures, the more advanced methods to, to, to determine capital, uh, they are no, no longer available. And the big banks don't like it very much because uh, they thought that using these most advanced methods would be good for them because then they would be able to try to save capital. But that's not the case now for a number of credit risk exposures. And the other point I would like perhaps to highlight is, is the higher capital requirements that we have uh, coming with Basel III, uh, which is a problem for banks expected to play a countercyclical role, which is the, the, the situation we are experiencing now. Perhaps there are a number of studies saying, oh, what a great job that the development banks are doing in this time of crisis, in part because we want to show them that they can play that role. But if you really look at what banks are doing around the world, there'll be many development banks that they're not doing anything. And I, I, I'm a testament to that because I'm here now in South Africa and I, I don't see much happening uh, with regards to the development banks of this country. And that's really unfortunate. Uh, okay, so going back to preliminary conclusions and suggestions going forward, uh, we think that the biggest constraint from Basel III is not so much from the complexity of the framework, which is really complex, uh, but more from the rather simple fact that uh, uh, there is the move towards tightening the levels of capital requirement. And that's problematic for these banks, as I said before, because the big issue for us is to be able to lend at scale. And then uh, another point perhaps I'd like to highlight, perhaps I mentioned that before, is on climate risk and climate finance. The framework currently as it is now, it, doesn't, the, 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 it discourages a climate uh, finance. And, and finally, uh, we propose, we think it would be good if banks, national development banks could have a separate tailored framework that do take account of their specific characteristics and development roles. Okay, so that's just what the paper is about. And then uh, the idea now is that we use the time we have, the remaining time, to try to uh, raise questions that could be good for future research or for improving the paper itself. And one that has, I will touch on is a question, a point made by one of our reviewers. He said the following about our paper. Look, there is something that I feel is missing which is you could discuss a little bit the political economy of Basel III, of adoption of Basel III, why Basel III is adopted in certain ways. And, and in, in, indeed, there is a very nice, very solid literature on that, on adoption of Basel III, the political economy. It's about uh, regulatory convergence as opposed to regulatory divergence and why. Some countries go in one direction, other countries go in another direction. So we do a little bit of that discussion in the paper now, but we need more because all this literature is really focused on banks in general uh, and it, they don't look at national development banks. So it would be nice that we have something about national development banks, but because in part because I think the, the issues are different and the reasons why are different as well. I just wanted to touch, to, to say one thing that within that we have the concept of proportionality. When you think about uh, regulatory divergence, what does it mean? It's regulators in a country uh, recommending regulation which diverges from uh, international standards, okay? Then we have the concept of proportionality which overlaps with, though, with that of divergence, which is about if you look at one country, then the regulator sees in that country that the banking system in, in that country is not homogeneous enough. Actually, it's heterogeneous. It has different banks, bank ca categories and, and some diversity. So what the regulator does then is to uh, offer, recommend to the smaller banks a uh, simpler approach, uh, which means that then these banks would uh, have less of the regulatory burden on, on their banks that the financial costs with compliance would lower. Uh, but the point I want to make in relation to that is that that's 
really about uh, proportionality, meaning that there is less regulatory burden, but that does not necessarily mean that the regulation will be less stringent for these banks. On the contrary, it could even be more stringent. And even the Basel framework itself has the concept of proportionality embedded in it because it provides a menu of options of which you can choose the simpler approach. But going for the simple approach does not necessarily mean that uh, the regulation itself will be less stringent. It could be even more stringent. And the reason why I'm raising this point is that when we go move back to the literature about convergence and divergence, I think I have the suspicion that we have a similar problem with the literature on divergence because we may detect some regulatory divergence, but that does not necessarily mean that it's a good thing. What it means is that it's dealing with the issue of complexity, but it's not dealing with the issue of scalability, right? It's not divergent because it wants banks to do their job. It's not divergent because they want to protect national development banks. So I really think that that's a very exciting, interesting area for future research. I stop there and pass on now to uh, my colleague, uh, Lavinia Barros de Castro. Well, here in Brazil is morning, so good morning, everyone. <laughs> Thank you very much for this invitation. Thank you, Stephanie, it's an honor and a pleasure to be with you here. Thank you, Ulrich, and all the presenters and all the ones who organized this great conference. So I think the slides are already in the screen. So um, could you, I think we are in a short time, so I'm gonna be like right to the point. Thank you, Ricardo, and thank you, Jejun, which is the co-author also of this paper. So could you move, please? Next slide. Do you, oh no, so I think I should share. Well, let me see. Yeah, so the idea here is starting a conversation more like <clears throat> on financial regulation. So yeah, some, I always ask myself some embarrassing questions when uh, we are like discussing and finishing a paper. So when we finish the paper, I think you always have to ask yourself, after all, why this research is relevant? Why discussing financial regulation development banks now? Well, my answer to this question would be that the word before the COVID crisis already had problems with low growth, increasing inequalities, the challenges of the future of the work, and climate change. So this terrible crisis aggravates problems that already existed and requires bold action. The point is that development banks are institutions where their mandates are directly related to sustainable development goals. So they can be important actors in promoting this agenda globally, and they are not, of course, the only ones, but they are relevant actors, someone that can make a difference in the game since they build bridges between the private and the public sector. If you accept that, then you could ask, so should the development banks be regulated at all? When discussing this issue of prudential regulation development banks, the first argument someone might think is that development banks do not collect demand deposit, catch deposits. So the argument seems to be strifle. They do not imply systemic risk in the strict sense of bank grants. Well, if we consider only the banks that do not collect, cash deposits. This answer be, may be not enough. Development banks could create theoretically a credit crisis if they are big enough or at least big enough for some sectors, or even a fiscal problem if they have to be saved by their governments, or even they can create some systemic risk indirectly by implying the bankruptcy of other banks depending on their credits. Well, this possibility are all remote, but this is not the main issue here. So let's clarify our point. We agree that development banks must be under supervision in order to maintain appropriate risk management practice and financial sustainability over time. As a matter of fact, history shows that development banks that consistently present weakness do not survive. They are not supported by the governments, either by society in the long term. The question here is the Basel rules are the right framework for doing so. But then someone more familiar with the Basel rules could go to the third question and in the opposite direction and argues that Basel rules are a collection of sound risk management practice. Shouldn't Basel standards be applied to all banks in the same form? Here, interesting finds emerge from our research. The three banks we investigated, Chinese Development Bank, KFW, and the Brazilian Development Bank, revealed that the adoption of the Basel standards has indeed brought some benefits better integrated data and risk systems, better management practice and governments. Also, they say that being under international standards 
sometimes help it to avoid political pressure to take excessive risk. Furthermore, someone can also add that Basel is like a quality seal for market fundraising. Although, in the case of both CDB and KFW, it seems that low borrowing costs in capital markets has little to do with Basel compliance and much more with government support. They receive guarantees from the states and that make all the difference. So moving for the, full pro the fourth question, the prop, no, 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 not, not the slides, please. <laughs> Just one, uh, e -O yeah, okay, <laughs> the questions again, yeah. So the problem is that Basel models had been calibrated having large private banks as reference and do not have development challenges in mind. This is a problem. If Basel standards make it difficult for development banks to fulfill their mandates. So the question is, do these banks deserve special treatment? What can regulations do to adapt Basel rules in order to reduce possible impacts? These are the central questions for the article. Based on the assumption that national development banks are indeed different in terms of funding mandates and operational modalities, this paper focuses on the potential impacts of Basel trade capital framework for development banks regarding their ability to fulfill their development mandates. We, is, we examine the current Basel III framework and ask ourselves analytically what rules can hypothetically bring potential damage. And here I comes for some comment that Christopher Humphrey said, well, interesting, well, the Lavinia, 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 sorry to interrupt you. Um, you're more or less running out of time. So okay, I'm just sorry. concluding. Yeah, okay, I'm just concluding. Okay, so, uh, well, I'm gonna, I would say that to, to Christopher that uh, the risk aversion of some development banks are not just related to basal rules or basal standards, but they certainly do not help. So um, what, and so let's go to the 50 question, but if the paper investigates only three cases, how can the author generalize conclusions without extensive research? So please move on. Well, first, these are not ordinary cases. I'm not seeing the slides, but they are three out of the largest national development banks in the world in terms of assets. And the other slide, maybe I can share here. Well, okay, please the other slide and then the other slide. You can keep this one. So, uh, and then if you look, please one up. Uh, if you see those banks do not face capital constraint. So if those who are not restricted realize that there are things in Basel that, that can make it difficult to exercise their mandate, if it's valid for them, imagine for those who have less capital. Well, you can, uh, this research is only a first step. It's necessary to understand whether smaller banks have other relevant issues not yet mapped in this research. Besides, even for three case studies, capital can be not an asset, uh, can be not an issue in the present, but if it's necessary to expand low and guarantees broadly, given the challenge of climate change infrastructure and innovation, for example, would Basel standards be binding? Could it create a bias against long-term investment mostly need? Wouldn't development banks have enough instruments, including long-term liabilities, government guarantees, to address the risk they face? Would the Basel parameters be adequate for development bank own characteristics? So please, the last slides. So what I would like to do is change the perspective. Is the last slide, please. Uh, could you, yeah. If development banks can promote long-term loans since they have long-term liabilities and good guarantees, if they can select good projects since they have expertise in project evaluation, if they can leverage private resources and uh, so multiply productive investments, including green ones, wouldn't it be the case that development banks could help reducing the systemic vulnerability of the economy? Isn't this ultimately the primary objective of financial regulation. So let's think it oppositely. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lavinia and Ricardo. That was excellent presentation by both of you. Um, and uh, I, I really appreciate uh, all the insights you're offering us. Um, and now I would like to ask Ulrich and Frederic uh, to please uh, have 15 minutes on their presentation. Thank you.
you should see the screen now, right? You should see the slides. Um, so uh, thank you for having me. Uh, this is joint work with Frederick Charbonnier, which I'm afraid is probably not here because he had some uh, domestic uh, emergency, not a heavy one, but a, 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 so um, a, this is carbon policies and climate financial regulation. So um, since there's so much expectation now that the financial sector would play a crucial role in the move to carbon neutrality over the next 30 years, there's the natural question, what about regulators? And they're certainly interested, regulators and central banks, they've created their own club, the Network for the Greening of the Financial question, System, but they're not quite sure what, what their role should be. Should actually regulators play a role in the energy transition and facilitate these investments? And can they do so within their mandates? So some of the issues that make them hesitate, uh, why they th might think they're not well positioned is that they have a potential man mandate for financial regulation. They, they, they are not a climate uh, or an energy transition agency. And it's not green investment investments versus brown investment that may carry the biggest risk to financial stability, which after all is their mandate. And then there's obviously the discrepancy of horizons, stress tests of regulators are short run there for one year or two years. Whereas in climate finance, we think in centuries, right? The horizon is up to the, uh, the end of the century and the stress test, and they do, and now I uh, would have to uh, adjust to that. So the question is like, what are good and what are bad arguments for a climate finance um, regulation mandate? So as you see, this is about climate finance regulation in general. It's not about DFIs, but I will come to what is in it for DFIs uh, when I have presented what, what we are doing. Right? So um, there is discussion about amending the regulation framework to adjust to the needs for climate finance, but it typically doesn't go to the heart of the Basel III framework, of which we have seen you know, the, an excellent discussion in the work of uh, Lavinia, Ricardo, and Chia Jun uh, right before, and the pot potential constraints on NDBs. Uh, it's more about finding other levers of action, other instruments by which regulators can influence what the financial sector is doing. For example, imposing that there's transparency that so investors are see, seeing whether they invest in green stuff or brown stuff. It's about having this long stress test, but it's not clear what the actual consequence of these stress tests would be, unlike the standard financial stability stress tests, which have a clear, like, you know, a um, punitive side to them. This is also certainly, you know, why is this hesitation to look at the heart of this? For example, capital uh, requirement. There's two things. There is the the um, a um, the idea that the Basel III framework is a level playing field, right? That is to ensure that everyone is in the same page in terms of regulation matters. So you don't want to get out there. And this discussion is very much, you know, a, dominated by people that are working themselves in central banks, in their research departments, and a, around them. So, and a, um, the second hesitation is that Basel III is a multi-decade process. You don't want to unbundle that to stick in some new things like green finance in there. We take a contrasting view. We get head on to the to the heart of Basel III. We focus on capital requirements, right? because we want to abstract. So this is certainly probably the most decisive regulation of one of those, but it could be extended to work to other regulations like concentration risk or so that are very important for DFIs. And we're doing so by saying, well, uh, there are pragmatic solutions, right? The current framework could be made more bespoke, more flexible in a pragmatic way. And we take some, you know, uh, insight or impulse from the fact that there are already exceptions, like for example, the European capital requirement regulation has an SME supporting factor because small companies have a very heavy risk weight, which would possibly be an impediment to growth and innovation. So that allows already to give them a rebate on capital requirements up to 25%. And something like that could be sort of what we are saying here, suggesting here could be translated in the green supporting factor. 
So after setting the stage, I want to go into brief outline of the model and then how we model financial regulation and bailouts, which is one of the ideas that we're promoting here, present some theory results and then go into numbers, which are a, a not many and calibration and then look at implications for DFIs. As we have seen, this is a theory exercise. So I take you to different field to, to economic theory to think about this. And where we start actually is that we shouldn't think about financial regulation in isolation. We should think about this together with carbon regulation, right? The environmental economists who have thought about energy transition for much longer than we do, they say, well, we have an answer. It's the carbon price, it's the carbon tax, right? And this should stimulate. Why do we need something like the financial sector and special regulation that like incentivize the financial sector to do something about this? If the carbon price is right, we don't need something else. We take this serious. And we look in particular at the interaction between carbon regulation, the carbon price and financial regulation, the carbon requirements. So we take into account that it's all about when do you do the green investments that reduce the carbon emissions? And that is all about the discount rate Right. So much of this controversy is between Nick Stern and Will, William Nordhaus is about which is the right discount rate that changes everything here and what is the climate systematic risk or the climate beta that we should take account. So we develop a model that takes this into account, take three sources of uncertainty about growth, about the cost of the green technology and about climate risks, about which we still know little, how this will play out in 60 years or so into such a model. We stick studiously to the current financial stability mandate of financial regulators. We are arguing more in a positive than a normative sense that even within that mandate, financial regulators will find that they will have to do something about a, um, a, the financial stability risk coming from climate risks. Whereas greenhouse gas emission and a reduction is a global common good, which should lead to an efficient carbon price, which would be globally uniform. That is different when we look at the other side of the climate risks, which is when we go from mitigation to adaptation. When it goes to adaptation of what we call resilience investment, it's true that they are very heterogeneous, right? DFIs are very aware of this. Some of them are in geographies like islands that are extremely exposed to rising sea levels or uh, droughts and wildfire. Uh, and they are very local investments, like basically provide, like um, a preventing the damage of climate damage and uh, is a local and heterogeneous investment. And much of our discussion focuses on that. There might be a rationale that's our argument for different regulatory framework there. So time is short. Let me not go too much in the middle just to give you an idea what it is. So we have an, um, a horizon of 60 years that will become clear when we do the calibration at the very end um, with uncertainty about the output, which is exogenous, but we model this as a rare disaster risk a la Barrow. This leads to emissions, carbon intensity Q, right? A, um, a carbon intensity Q, a, a, which is decreasing over time. So we produce yes carbon per unit out output. And this is reduced by the green investments, which we call abatement in the logic of en environmental economics. So this is all what is avoided by having green investments of all sides, uh, energy conservation or um, a, a renewable energy. This is produced the abatement at a convex cost curve, which is again, uncertainty here about the cost of abatement. This leads to um, emissions, right? Sort of like the 2000 gigatons that are up there in the atmosphere over the last 200 years. They are gradually increasing by 4, 40 more gigatons at the current level. There is a little bit of a decay of this delta, but this is a rate of less than 0.5% per year. That's why this is very sticky in the atmosphere up there. That leads to climate damage, which is uncertain. That's the third uncertain variable, which is the climate sensitivity. How does the cumulative emissions translate into temperature risk and then in damage? So besides the abatement effort, we introduce another investment in resilience, in adaptation, more on that on the next slide. We have a representative agent who maximizes power utility and he consumes what is left from output. Output is diminished by damages and by investment in abatement and by investment in adaptation or a, a resilience. So here's resilience. This is all that is in climate adaptation, which we said is often local and heterogeneous. So examples could be 
climate resilient infrastructures for transportation, uh, energy and water systems, right? It could be the new climate infrastructure that you have to build in terms of like dams to prevent like a flooding, shelters when uh, disaster strikes, a, like mitigating the reflect or the increasing sun reflection, the changes in agriculture, how land is used, how vegetation is used. Some of these resilient investments have a more global reach, right? If you have reforestation or you have measures that would improve the radi radiative forcing that has impact beyond the locality where it is. But still it's true that overall there's a lot of this that should be heterogeneously adjusted locally. So there is a technology there. This invest can reduce the damage. And we've modeled this as a simple quadratic function here. So the representative agent or the planner so we're looking at the agent actually having optimal incentives acting like the planner, having the optimal preventive investments or resilient investment that reduces the damage here with this quadratic function at a cost R. Right? And we find, as we find in such a simple quadratic formulation, we have a slightly more general setup, but this is this is the, the I mean the good enough to make the argument is that you indeed reduce the dog cross damage. And of course, part of this cross damage reduction comes at the expense of having this resilience investment RT, but still there's a net improvement of what can be consumed. One of the issues is that the representative agent, when he does this kind of infrastructure investment, may internalize only a part of the benefits of that. So we solve this Sorry, in a fancy way. Have, this is a recursive uh, model. Yeah. You have your maximum five minutes. So. Okay. I think I can get go through most of this, right? We solve this recursively with the constraint that I've shown to you. We do this as a numerical exercise, but what this leads to is basically a first order condition, which says like how much you want to invest into climate mitigation today and how much tomorrow depends on the discount factor, the stochastic discount factor, which includes the climate beta. And what's important in this model that we want to allow for the state contingency. Regulators become active in bad states of the world. In this bad states of the world, this stochastic discount factor would be high. And this gives then the rise, this model explains the optimal carbon price trajectory, which is against which financial regulation would be up with. Right? So what does capital requirement do here? they would reduce the cost of financing of abatement investments and of resilience investment. Here's a numerical little bit of a, you know, exercise that shows that, for example, if you have infrastructure investment that would have high leverage of 75% and you reduce the risk weight on this infrastructure from one to 0 0.5, it would have a meaningful impact on the cost of capital. And if you reduce this risk weight accordingly, that would increase in this optimal optimization problem that I've shown you here, right, would increase the investment in resilience by 10%, similar for AD. What is important here, and that's important for DFIs, this is under the thinking that there's no financial constraints, right? Much of what you are doing as DFIs is you're providing financing where no one else is going because there are financial constraints. Here in our model, there is an optimal investment here. If there are financial constraints, then the additional financing, the multiplier that DFIs can get out of being able to finance more is directing, has an e producing an even bigger multiplier effect. Here's the bailout. And the idea for the bailouts is best illustrated by what we're currently seeing in 2020 with the pandemic crisis, right? There's so much monetary and fiscal policy support that there's estimation telling us the raw GDP impact of the pandemic shock to the world economy is probably cut in half by all the support that is coming. And something similar we can imagine will happen for climate disasters, right? There will be, and we summarize all of this, the fiscal, the monetary policies that come after climate disasters as bailouts, not to be confounded with bailouts of banks, right? It's the bailouts of the real economy, everything that goes there. What is now important is that this will weaken the incentives of the private agents to invest in resilience. If they think, well, the government will provide sell shelter if the flood comes, if the wildfire burns and so on, we don't have to invest so much privately or as a municipality, as a local community into raising our resilience against this. So this is what we are doing. This B is a factor that includes like the damage is exposed reduced that reduces the investment incentives and the regulators want to take this account ex ante and doing some counter cyclical you know, investment incentives to actually counteract this perverse in fact of their own actions. 
this is the results that we're doing. First, if the carbon price is efficient, if resilient investment is efficient, because the agents are internalizing everything, then there is no role for climate financial regulation. But now have a look at this, and this is one of the central ideas that we have, that there is this perverse effect of that because people get after the climate disaster bailouts, that weakens their resilience investment, that already creates a reason for regulators to step in, in a positive analysis within their current mandate, and to say, okay, we want to differentiate capital requirements, give such a rebate on green investments, that could very well be complemented by, of course, by a surcharge on brown investment, on investments that increase a, um, a, the, the opposite. But this is focused on the resilience investment, right? We are not yet looking at the abatement investments because we are still in an environment where the carbon price trajectory is efficient. Something similar, exact same result we get if there's an inefficient, insufficient internalization of the resilience efforts. This is only interesting to look at the following, right? So there is, of course, other public policies like fiscal policies which take the lead on this kind of things. But if they're incomplete, regulators will step in and will differentiate their standards. And finally, and this is the relevant scenario, what happens if the carbon policies, the carbon price, remain as inefficient in all the countries you observe as it is the case right now? Then financial regulators really can derive from such a model, uh, model a mandate to not only encourage resilience investment, but also abatement investments by differentiating the capital requirements. So do I, how many minutes do I have, Stephanie? I still have two minutes for the calibration, oh, one minute? Not really, not really, but we'll okay, one. Good. Yeah. Okay, so what we do is like we model this over the 60 year horizon, cutting this in six periods. Every of the three shocks is binomial. And we look at so far just two scenarios, a Paris Accord scenario, we are basically, the world is carbon neutral by 2050, leaves the remaining carbon budget that's optimal allocated until then. And the business as usual scenario, the world is con continuing to burn through 40 gigatons of uh, CO2 net addition to the carbon stock uh, or carbon emissions in the world. Right? In the Paris Accord scenario, and then we do what would, would that mean? Sorry for the, this should be a, a, a larger than, a larger than. So we find that there is a substantial variation in the damage function. But overall, right now, these probabilities of this very adverse scenarios where we have high damage functions of up to 15% of the GDP is so low that regulators probably don't want to in a meaningful way differentiate their standards. It's different in the, in the bad business usual scenarios. There we develop arguments, look at these damages with a 3% probability or in 2050 already 20% of the world GDP would be lost in climate related damage. Then regulators want to step in right now and very soon. So here are six arguments why these arguments should be particularly important for PFIs, but I leave them to the audience because I need to stop. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Sorry to be uh, so... No, no, it's, it's, no, it's normal. It's like we are late in time and this was a long presentation. This is very, very interesting. A lot of interesting new concepts, like Ricardo talking about proportionality doesn't mean that the regulation is less stringent. Uh, Lavinia saying that NDBs can actually reduce the risk of financial stability. Uli, Ulrich saying that, uh, talking about green supporting factor, which is really interestingly developed. Uh, and he talks about the bailout of the real economy. So we have, I think, very innovative, parallel positions on financial regulation. So now I will, uh, we, we were supposed to have two commentators. One is absent, but I send a video. So I'm going to ask if it can be kindly downloaded by Andrew Walter, and then we'll have Uli Waltz giving a comment. Thank you very much for the opportunity to comment on this interesting paper again. Uh, now, with apologies for uh, my inability to attend uh, the conference today, uh, let me start quickly uh, on my comments. Um, so the main points, uh, uh, firstly, that I like the reframing of the revised paper, um, which is a normative question about how regulators should tailor Basel III to national development banks. However, I have some remaining queries. Firstly, the motivating part of the paper, I think, is still somewhat ambiguous on the question of whether Basel III compliance by NDBs is a hypothetical issue or a substantive policy and developmental problem. 
the three case comparisons, the three major development banks uh, that are addressed in the paper, um, does this comparison really support the claim that Basel III has large potential development costs? I'm still not quite convinced uh, that uh, the paper or the evidence in it really does support this claim. And thirdly, answering your revised normative question would seem to require greater analytical attention uh, to the impact of variation in the discretionary national approaches to MDV regulation in your three K in your three cases than the paper currently provides. On the first question of whether the problem is hypothetical or a substantive one, you still tend to emphasize the hypothetical in the framing in that quote there on page two and again in section four. And I think this leaves the reader somewhat uncertain about which potential problems you identify uh, in your analysis of Basel III are most important for NDBs and indeed for governments. Your case comparison gives reasons why BNDES and KFW don't like all aspects of Basel III for various reasons, the most important in brackets there. But all three national regulators in Brazil, China, and Germany do exercise substantial regulatory discretion for their NDBs, and this presumably reduces uh, its impact and, and thus uh, the developmental consequences. How much remains somewhat ambiguous uh, after reading the paper. On the question of the relationship between uh, capital requirements uh, under Basel III, uh, the top panel here shows capital adequacy ratios, uh, which are generally high across the three development uh, development banks, uh, higher in the case of uh, BN, BNDES in particular, but also KFW, uh, the CDB, but none appear dramatically capital constrained. Um, the lending uh, trajectories, uh, the disperse, total disbursement trajectories, which are graphed there on the bottom panel, uh, are quite different uh, in both of the, in all three of these cases. In any case, um, it's difficult to discern from the evidence you provide, which is summarized here, if there is any uh, relationship, any general relationship between uh, capital adequacy ratios and growth in total lending commitments. On the question of when and where the compliance costs are in fact high for NDBs and thus for countries, um, I think it would help if the paper could give concrete examples of governments that do make the kinds of regulatory compliance areas, errors rather, that you discuss in fairly hypothetical terms in the first part of the paper. This would increase the paper's impact. Towards the very end of the paper, you say that many smaller NDBs are very capital constrained. But if the real problem, in fact, lies here, rather than your three cases, uh, do the problems that these smaller NDBs have, uh, does this have much to do with Basel III, or do the problems rather lie at the national level and the kind of discretionary regulation that governments impose in these country cases? Secondly, do you overlook the potential empirical opportunity provided by the COVID, the COVID crisis? You say on page 15 that in crisis times, this is when NDB should be lending very rapidly and capital ratios can be quickly eroded uh, and thus become a, a severe constraint on the capacity of NDBs to do their job. But of course, uh, that, that uh, directly raises the question, we're in a crisis now. Have capital ratios been seriously eroded in 2020? Are they a serious constraint now? Now, it may be too early to tell, and that's too early for your paper, uh, but of course, this could be a, a question for future uh, research. On the question of appropriate NDB regulation, you now emphasize uh, more than in the previous version of the paper, how national regulators have substantial discretion in how they treat NDBs. But which of your three cases produces better developmental outcomes? You seem to prefer China's tailored regulation, but you don't provide a lot of supporting evidence for uh, this preference. Tailored regulation uh, for NDBs also, of course, implies uneven regulation across banks within countries and between countries. And so one of the questions I had, um, if you were making this argument, uh, is a corollary of this argument that there should be a strict demarcation of business lines uh, between NDB lending and lending by other, uh, particularly commercial banks. Is there always such strict demarcation uh, in your three cases? And if not, what are the consequences? Without demarcation of this kind, it would seem 
that regulatory arbitrage could substantially undermine both the effectiveness of differential or tailored regulation, as well as political support for it. Your green lending criticism finally is plausible, but uh, this clearly also applies to commercial bank lending. So I'd question whether it's uh, particularly applicable uh, to developmental uh, development banks. And again, uh, this relates to the question, uh, if commercial banks as well as NDBs are both lending to green projects, what are the consequences uh, of tailored regulation or differential regulation? Finally, on the nature of the evidence you provide. Might you be over relying on NDB interviews uh, in two of your cases? Might interviewees uh, have incentives to uh, underplay, underestimate uh, the problems um, that may arise from size, too big to fail, as well as the potential for political interference in lending. You still don't um, talk much about this in the paper, and I wonder whether this might be driven uh, by uh, uh, this uh, interview reliance on uh, two sets of NDBs. I would like to know, and I'm sure the readers uh, of the paper would like to know, what regulators think in Brazil and Germany uh, on uh, the set of questions that your paper poses. CDB uh, in China seems to be in a somewhat different position. You say on page 15 uh, that the key challenge for them is that essentially the regulator and supervisors increasingly expect them to align uh, in a regulatory uh, sense with uh, commercial banks. Um, but maybe China is different here. After all, its commercial banking system is dominated by large state-owned commercial banks. Um, and uh, thus it would seem that there's less demarcation uh, between the activities of developmental and commercial banks in China. And if that's the case, um, does it still follow that differentiated regulation is optimal in these kinds of cases? Thanks very much. Great. So uh, now uh, we would have the last commentator and then of course, the audience will have also a chance to comment, ask questions, and then we will finish by asking the panelists to reply. So now we have Uli Volz, who himself has done a lot of interesting work on incorporating climate change into financial regulation. So I look forward to his comments. Hi, hello. I'm just uh, trying to find my the right slide. One second, please. Sorry, one moment, please. Uh, too many files open. Okay. Um, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, great. Good. Sorry for this little delay. So uh, hello, and thanks a lot for, for having me. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to, to read this uh, paper by Frederick and Uli. Uh, and uh, this is indeed a topic that's very close uh, to my uh, own interests and, and research. And so the paper uh, technically is, I think, on a, on a very high level. And uh, I really don't think I, I, can, I can contribute much here. But I would like to say a bit about the, the framing uh, of the analysis. And uh, here I, in blue, I have a, a quote uh, from the intro um, where the authors highlight that they take, uh, adopt a, a cautious view of the role of regulators and um, basically focus on the financial stability uh, uh, role or kind of maintaining financial stability. And uh, I would like to, to uh, question that a bit. I mean, um, of course, I agree that regulators cannot substitute for climate policies, but uh, central banks uh, clearly have a, a mandate that goes much beyond financial stability risk. Uh, so indeed, uh, uh, mandates uh, do highlight uh, economic responsibility in particular. Uh, so there are also various ways how climate change can have an impact on uh, price stability, macroeconomic stability more broadly. Uh, so I think that needs to be taken into account. Um, moreover, I think um, we also, and, and uh, by the way, uh, of course, 
uh, a lot of central banks have uh, formal multiple uh, uh, mandates. So the European Central Bank explicitly uh, has a secondary mandate to support the policies of the European Union. And uh, uh, as you will all know, currently the ECB is, is uh, doing its strategic review uh, where climate change is playing a very important role. And it is considering uh, to what extent it should uh, uh, use its uh, policy tools uh, to support European Union policy as part of the Green Deal uh, and the Paris uh, growth and so on. So uh, I think we need to, to um, frame this a bit broader, even if uh, you want to keep your, your uh, specific uh, uh, focus of the paper. Um, I think it's also important to acknowledge the market shaping role of central banks and supervisors. Um, so markets just don't develop by themselves. I mean, that's also when we discuss uh, uh, public development banks, uh, they too have a market shaping role and uh, central banks are uh, the other public bodies and also supervisors who, who have this role. And uh, so um, uh, I think we, we need to, to frame the discussion a bit more broadly, including uh, these things. Um, and lastly, um, in the model, uh, you, you take a long-term uh, uh, perspective, uh, but you don't really discuss in the paper um, what time frames regulators should consider. And I think this is really a key question. I mean, you all know uh, Mark Carney's famous speech about the tragedy of horizons, uh, which I think really nails the problem. And uh, I sense that there is increasingly in central banking and supervisory circles an understanding uh, that uh, longer term macro financial risks really need to be taken into account. Um, and, and this would then have an impact on policies. Um, so the paper uh, focuses uh, very much on capital requirements. And uh, I agree that this is a very important aspect of the regulatory agenda. Um, but I also wonder um, wh why you don't uh, at least discuss um, uh, this is a bit uh, more broadly because uh, there are a lot of different uh, prudential instruments uh, that could be used. And I think even if you don't include them uh, in the model, uh, I think you should at least uh, discuss that briefly. And um, uh, so here is a, a little overview of, of uh, the prudential toolbox, uh, which can be uh, adjusted in a, a climate sensitive or sustainability sensitive way. And uh, you mentioned stress testing and so on, but, but you only mentioned that very briefly. And um, so I would argue that uh, uh, the Basel III instruments, uh, including uh, capital requirements are only one tiny piece uh, of the picture. And uh, we not only have micro prudential instruments, but also, and in the climate context, that is very, very important, uh, a large set of macro prudential instruments uh, that I think are very relevant. Um, and uh, for example, right now, there is a very intensive discussion going on about collateral frameworks, uh, where also Christine Lagarde uh, from the European Central Bank is saying, yeah, we need to look at these kind of things. Um, cyclic, in, uh, cyclical instruments uh, and so on uh, really need to be part of the picture. And again, I do understand uh, that, you know, uh, for the modeling exercise you undertake, you can't throw all, all these things in. Um, but I think it's important to, to, to um, at least paint the bigger picture. Uh, here is the kind of uh, self-advertisement uh, uh, slide. Um, in June, uh, with Nick Robbins and Simon Dickow, uh, I published a, a toolbox for sustainable crisis response measures for central banks and supervisors. Uh, we'll have a, a second edition where we actually look at um, what 180 central banks have been doing uh, over the past nine months uh, what tools they have used and how these could be calibrated in a sustainable way. Uh, so this will be coming out in November. Uh, and uh, I really think there needs to be this broader framing. Uh, last but not least, I want to um, uh, quickly touch on one point uh, regarding the, uh, the bailout uh, that you discuss. Um, so you assume that ex post accommodation will occur in very bad climate outcomes, defined as damages, um, and you refer to that as a bailout benefit. And this will then uh, be anticipated, and, and so there was, there was kind of this perverse effect. 
Now, I wonder whether this is really kind of, I don't know, <laughs> realistic, because, um, you know, if, if we talk about climate change and, and the catastrophic effects of climate change, uh, we're not talking about some, some minor damages here or there. Uh, we go, we're, we're looking at potentially devastating impacts on our economies. And uh, could we really expect regulators or government for that matter to bail out investors? Um, or if we kind of look at uh, the transition risks, which are also a very important part of this story, um, you know, if you have some, some dramatic re uh, uh, revaluation of assets because uh, markets wake up, something happening, um, and, and kind of, or an oddly transition, uh, can we really expect supervisors uh, or central banks to, 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 to rescue the day? I'm not sure. And, and is that something that, that uh, financial... Uh, finan Yeah, on assets, I think uh, that we missed a little bit of what you were saying, Uli, because I think there was a problem with the internet. Sure. Can you hear me again? Hello. Yes. Yes. You're okay. Fine. Yeah. Sorry. Um, uh, so last point I just wanted to make is regarding uh, some wording, uh, in particular the use of, of the term brown acids. Uh, there has been, uh, since the uh, Black Lives Matter movement, uh, a lot of discussion in sustainable finance circles that uh, this term should not be used anymore, and uh, so there have been proposals to replace that with other terms, so you may want to use non-sustainable or whatever acids, but uh, I think that uh, minor point, but, but maybe not completely unimportant. Uh, with that, let me finish and um, uh, just uh, reiterate again, it's a very interesting paper. But I think just kind of the framing could be broadened a little bit um, to, to uh, pick on some of these aspects. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Uli. Um, we're running a little bit late, um, probably fault of the chair. Um, but uh, also because we had such interesting presentations. Uh, in the chat box, I really have only questions, very good questions, but only two questions from Eva Gutierrez from the World Bank. And maybe the best thing is if she can, if it's easy, if she can take the floor and ask them. I, I think particularly the first question is actually uh, to do with um, development banks in general, not just with regulation, but the aims of development banks. Um, and I, I personally have a view on that, but I think she should ask the question and also then the question please on Basel counter cyclical capital buffers, which I think very much fits in with the first paper. Um, Eva, can you ask the questions yourself? Sure, thank you, Stephanie. Um, so, so the question is one of the premises on the paper, uh, on the first paper, that is that the purpose of development banks is lend at a scale uh, to support development development goals. And, and my question here is um, whether um, you know the vision is for for banks to do all the lending related to sustainable development finance, or to use the balance sheet to crowd in private sector investments um, and funding towards sustainable development goals because the implications for the operations and the balance sheet size of the development banks are gonna be very different. Um, and I am not sure if there is a consensus on, uh, on what is the, the, the role of development banks. And, and the second was um, the paper discussed um, Basel III and how Basel III is inhibiting um, uh, the possibility of uh, counter-cyclical role of development banks, uh, theoretically. And, and I was wondering whether they have looked at the issue. Basel III uh, includes a counter-cyclical buffer. And in all countries that we have seen uh, adopted Basel III in this current context of the COVID, the counter-cyclical buffers have been released. Um, so that have increased the power of the banks uh, and this is a clear advantage vis-a-vis -vis Basel II, which didn't have any counter-cyclical Basel. 
uh, or country city or capital. Um, so it's certainly this is probably insufficient um, for uh, for for the size of of lending that that might be required in the in the in the current grant. But then the question, uh, I guess, arises of whether uh, national development banks who have a larger countercyclical bank uh, role should have a higher countercyclical uh, capital uh, buffer. And, and that could be a mechanism to, to help them manage their capital to effectively perform countercyclical role. Thank you very much, Eva. Um, I don't have any other comments. Um, so, but you have a, a, a rich um, set of comments from the two commentators. On, on, on Eva's first question, if I may, before I pass the word again to the paper authors, um, I, I don't really understand the dilemma because my impression is that development banks should do both, where, particularly where they have access to capital markets. So uh, I think they should lend as much as possible at scale, but they should also try and catalyze uh, private lending, private investing, and so on. Um, and we discussed that uh, quite a lot in our paper uh, tomorrow. But um, I don't want to, and, and, but the second question is really very interesting about what, what has actually been done, the regulatory forbearance that has happened under COVID, which I think is a really important thing and whether that should be done also in, in, in a future looking way, whether uh, development banks should have uh, large counter cyclical buffers, or as I heard once the, the, the head of the BPI say, the French BPI, whether, the, the development banks should have higher capital in general, precisely for these kind of circumstances. So they don't have to go back to governments and negotiate increases in capital, but have an implicit capital buffer by having uh, a larger capital than they may need in normal times. Um, so I would like now to uh, give the word maybe five minutes for each paper uh, to, sorry, to be a bit strict, but we're running a bit late, to Ricardo Lavinia and Jajun uh, to answer the, the comments, and then five minutes for Uli Hege. So we finish on the hour, more or less. Uh, perhaps I could go first very quickly, just two minutes. And I I think that Eva's questions are really excellent questions. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, absolutely right. I think that I didn't emphasize that point that one of the roles of NDBs is precisely this catalytic role. So you are absolutely right. But then I go with Stephanie that I don't see much either or. I think it could be both. But also because if you focus only on, on co-financing, the question for me then is, how far can that go? Uh, and that's a question for you, Eva, if it's true that you are from the World Bank. So you could try to answer the question for me. Uh, then on the second point, Basel III counter cyclical capital buffers, again, you're absolutely right that there are these buffers. And what I can say, I'm here now in, Africa, in, in South Africa, and the government did use these uh, buffers uh, they, it released the buffers for the banks to lend more. So this instrument was used. I think it's very helpful. But our commentator, Andrew Walter, said that our paper has a problem as being hypothetical. But on that question, the reason why I raised the point on counter-cyclical role and, and the crisis was a point raised by the empirical part of the paper uh, based on our interviews with with bankers, development bankers, they did make that point. It doesn't come from us. It doesn't come from our from the hypothetical part of the paper. It comes from the empirical part of the paper. That's why I made that point. But I do acknowledge that that there is these buffers, which yes, they are very helpful. Perhaps not sufficient, but helpful. Uh, I don't see much results here in South Africa, though. I'm sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. Would you like to add something, Lavinia and uh, Jajun, also on, on the- I think Jajun wants comments. to speak, and then I would also like to make a few comments. Please, Jajun. Okay, so I will make 
two brief comments uh, to Andrew's comment. The first one uh, is, is compliance with Basel Accord by NDBs a hypothetical case or a substantial issue? So to answer this question, um, you know, we actually have tried to conduct a survey among NDBs. So we have selected 50 NDBs in terms of the income level of their country, the asset size, and the mandate. So we try to be representative. And after a lot of coordination effort, we have got 50% of the bank have answered our question. So among the 20, uh, 24 banks, 16 banks explicitly acknowledge that they are subject to the same regulatory rules as commercial banks do in its jurisdiction. And they are very close to Basel Accord. So which means that you know, among these samples, about two thirds of the NDBs are subject to Basel Accord. So this implies that the compliance with Basel Accord for NDBs is not a hypothetical case. It's a real issue. Even though our current paper only focus on the three big NDBs now, this is my first point. My second point is, is uh, <clears throat> respond the uh, question by Andrew about under what conditions do tailored regulation works. And Andrew pointed out one condition that is demarcation between commercial banks and NDBs in terms of their operations. So I buy in its argument. In case of CDB, CDB was established in 1994 by the Chinese government in order you know, to separate policy lending from the four big commercial banks in China. So this kind of a deliberate effort by the government to demarcate the, uh, the operation between NDB and commercial banks in China. So the first demarcation, I think it's, it's important condition. I would like to add the second condition under which tailored re regulation may work. The second condition is that whenever there's any kind of deviation from Basel Accord, whenever there's any kind of discretion granted by the regulators, they have to be justified on the development ground instead of you know, being granted on an ad hoc basis. Otherwise, this tailored regulation may actually undermine the operational autonomy of these NDBs. Because in some sense, you know, a strict financial regulation may provide a safeguard for NDBs to guard against some undue inter, uh, uh, intervention from the government. So these are my two, um, two feedback on the uh, question by, by Andrew. Yeah, hand over to you, Lavinia. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, perfect. I totally agree, um, Judge Jung. Thank you for clarifying us. And just to be uh, to emphasize, the NDS is exempted from Basel III only for the liquidity ratio, and KFW for the liquidity ratio and some disclosure requirements. And even CDB that has been subject to a tailored regulatory framework in practice, the level of alignment with the Basel III framework seems very high, at least regarding capital requirements. So agreeing with Jejun about the question raised about leveling the play of field, and then I will agree to from the table before me. If we are discussing leveling the field, the playing field among development banks, I'm sure the, the the main problem will be exchange rate risk, not capital, not capital leveling the play of field. Okay, so that will be the big issue. And and if it if and if it means leveling the play of field between development banks and the private banks, they are not supposed to compete. They are complementary in many senses. Okay, um, the argument of too big to fail, this, I think does not apply for development banks. It could be like more a fiscal risk concern because if the government saves the bank, then we'll have some fiscal consequence. So it's not the usual too big to fail argument. Uh, third, uh, the fact that those banks have not been binding now, the three of them, um, does not mean that the question is not important. It's like, like in the microeconomic theory, imagine you have a large budget. Do the price of goods and services still matter? Yes, but of course it matters more if you are in a short budget, okay? And we are thinking about the future, the future role that it's necessary for the development banks. And about the question of correlation, correlation would not be founded. So many control variables to understand and, and macroeconomics, government, government guidelines and so on. And as just Christopher Humper just say, 
the question is, some developments are risk averse. And of course, basal regulation is not the only issue, reason for being risk averse. So, uh, but they do matter. They can have implications. So, uh, and about COVID, I, I'm afraid it's too soon to understand its effects properly. Uh, first, I think non-performing loans can still increase. And some development banks answer by providing, for example, risk add on their debt, which is great, which help a lot. Will, that will not show in loans, for example. Or, and if they provide guarantees, sometimes like in BNDS, we did a lot of guarantees with some government extra money that came with the risk from the government that will not show in our loans. So correlation will not appear that clear. That's the main point I would like to make. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all three of you. And now, uh, uh, Ulrich, you have the last word. Okay, I try to be brief that we can stick almost to, to the deadline that, that you imposed. Thank you, Uli, so much for the comments. Uh, these are wonderful comments. They will be very helpful, very precise, and especially since you stepped in, agreed to step in as a as discussant very last uh, late. So um, just four a, as little uh, remarks on, on what you said. First, the mandate of the central banks, uh, of the regulators and central banks. And by the way, we are not really distinguishing between regulators and central banks. So in that sense, it is large. And also, if we think about how this would translate, what would be climate adverse climate scenarios where the central banks, for example, um, a step in if financial stability is concerned, there's a lot of leeway. But there's another concern which we should probably highlight in the paper, which is that be beyond the current mandate, there is also in the modern democracies a question of political legitimacy. Right? For example, we had a discussion at the Bank of France about this when they started to get serious about climate finance that day, both the Bank of France people and other people told them, well, this was right about when a timid attempt in France to introduce a carbon tax on fuel was yellow wasted away by the yellow west movement. But, and then it was clear the central bank cannot substitute itself for a political process that is in an impasse. On the other hand, that is precisely what we're doing, inefficient carbon policies gives a mandate for central banks to basically clean up behind. Right? Second point on the horizon. I fully agree with you and with Mark Carney on the tragedy of Ryzen. We should point this out, it's not in the paper, but implicitly we actually take the view the central bank has a very long horizon, potentially an infinite horizon, right? That's, that's part of the analysis. You're right in pointing to the rich arsenal of instruments of the of central banks, uh, of, of regulators and central banks, and we do actually do macro potential regulation, right? That's implicit because we're talking about climate related disasters and their macro um, events. So the interaction between the exposed bailout, and I come to that in, in, in my um, final comment, and, and the ex ante prevention of that is a counter cyclical policy, right? It's not just micro, it is macro. And let me come back to then final remark on bailouts. I take from you that we have to really work on this to make this clearer, this motivate. And the word bailout is certainly a bad word, right? We, we, we take this from the classical forbearance discussion of micro potential regulation, but it's certainly there. You know, look at the global financial crisis. What has happened to fiscal policies, what has happened to monetary policies can be understood in this large sense of actually providing cushions to the private sector. And it's again happening with the pandemic crisis. I'm more concerned about how we can model this, understand this and calibrate this. Given that climate disasters, we have of course this very acute climate disaster, climate events, weather events that will come like um, a wildfires, a drought and so on, but it's a slow motion train wreck, right? And how can we think about this and all the public policies that will come and you know accommodate the impact of the shock for the private sector, but it will be there, there's no doubt. But we have to work on this to motivate clearer and to be more precise. Thanks so much for your comments. Thank you very much, Uri. That was very good answers, uh, as well as the other, uh, Lavinia and Ricardo and Tejun. I think the last point you made is really important. It's not just about financial regulation. It's how we make the whole society and all the economic policies um, take account the seriousness of risks that are not actually so clear. When you respond to a financial crisis, when you respond to a COVID crisis, you know, it's happening in real time and then people react and usually react quite well. 
But here you have a, the, the bad things that are going to happen maybe in 20, 30 years. How do you make policymakers and regulators react now to that? So your modeling and so on is very, very helpful. Well, thank you very much. It's been a really, really interesting session. Uh, and I invite all the participants and, and yourselves, if you have time, to join us again tomorrow, because we have another, tomorrow and the day after, we have uh, another set of very interesting papers and discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Stephanie. Bye-bye. See you bye -bye. tomorrow. Thank See you, you all. Thank you tomorrow. Thank you.